ones. Yeah. I, forget, I forget the name, but there, it's sort of, sort of like there's a Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, there's a Massachusetts Association of Town Managers, Town Administrators. They said that we hear from that group a lot more than we hear from the superintendents. We hear from the Board of Selectmen a lot more than we hear from school committees. And they were telling us, you need to have your school committees contact us, write us letters, tell us what you need. Mm -hmm. You need your superintendents to do the same thing. Um, because the other groups, that, they're not saying we're in competition with town administrators, uh, but they're saying that was their example they gave that day. They, they gave that specific example of we hear from the town administrators group all the time. Uh, and, and, and obviously whatever group, whatever advocacy group it is, they're saying that's who we're hearing from. Right. So, um, so we, I'd like to support that. I'd like to um, have letters from the school committee go out with a similar, similar feeling. Uh, if the school committee is comfortable with doing that, uh, we had something. I didn't put it under recommendations. I put it under communications because it's a letter I wrote and sent to all these people. Uh, and, but well, I think it's something maybe we might want to take up as a discussion and vote and say, would you support a letter like this coming from the school committee uh, that would go off to. Uh, Senator Pacheco, uh, State Representative Gifford, uh, and, and our local representatives. Would someone here like to make a motion uh, that we accept Scott's letter to be forwarded under our name that we can sign on to? I'll make a motion to approve uh, the letter that Scott has brought up to send out to uh, Mr. Pacheco and the other uh, legislators. Second. Have a second? You have a second? Um, any discussion on this? So one other thing to bring to light, because in that meeting it was it was an interesting meeting. But he also led outside of education, you know. And one of the things that they were promoting a lot was that the the elderly population is growing mm -hmm. and the child population is is stabilizing, and they hear from the elderly more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. The advocates for the elderly more than anybody else. Um, but I've had, I mean, they they've been reaching out. Like Senator Pacheco's aide has reached out quite a bit to tell us about meetings, meetings. and trying. So they're, they're they're really trying to get a good perspective from people. And I had mentioned a couple of times about working with this committee and forming a committee that just gets together like once a month and and sort of has volunteers who come and just make calls and start making calls and do that on them. You know, maybe get some selectmen involved. Just get a bunch of people from town involved to to make calls and contact those people on a consistent basis. You know, it's if you're doing it once a month, it's not that much of an obligation for everybody to buy into, right. but you're sort of getting a collaborative effort to reach out to them because the more they hear from us, the more they're going to listen. Well, the squeaky, squeaky wheel gets the, yeah. the grease, as the saying goes. But, yeah. I mean, if they're only hearing from the senior population and nothing against the senior population, but the, it makes it easy for our representatives on Beacon Hill to just push their energies towards them. Well, and I think to the point to have, it on a any sort group. Of, to have it on a sort of formulated committee where people meet, you're more representative of like Scott's letter is very articulate in what the meaning of what we're trying to persuade. So sometimes people just reaching out aren't going to be able to say or know the right things to say or or have the right terminology to express what they mean. So having a committee where people sort of have little scripted things to make their calls and to do make it a little bit easier to be more clear. More on Mark. So the recommendation from <clears throat> Jeff Riley was to send letters to your local representatives, so Senator Mike Pacheco uh, and Representative Susan William Gifford, and but then also to send a letter to um, Senator Jason Lewis, who is the joint, who is the chairperson uh, of the Joint Committee on Education. So he's going to be the person who's taking all these bills and and trying to bring them together to go a resolution. Uh, so that that's why I've crafted letters too. So one to Senator Jason Lewis, one to Mike Pacheco, and one to Susan Williams Gifford. Okay, and I'd um, love to do so under the school committee's name as well I think it sounds terrific I appreciate your I applaud your efforts for doing this and try to think out of the box here a little bit for the district uh, do I have a mo uh, I have a motion in a second already do I have uh, all those approve of acceptance Scott's letter aye aye it's unanimous all right there aye. You. thank you very much um, I'm going to move right into reports from the superintendent. Sure. All right. Personnel updates. Uh, <clears throat> so we've had a little bit uh, of movement in personnel. Uh, we our new hires: uh, Jennifer McCann in transportation, uh, Crystal, Crystal McColgan from food services, uh, and Maggie Farnham is a long-term substitute in transportation. Um, we have one other new hire that I'd like to introduce tonight, but I'm going to hold that for a second. Uh, we had some resignations: uh, Doug Borsari as a paraprofessional at the Middle High School, uh, Kelly Gibbs a long-term sub-parap. 
professional at the middle high school. Uh, Mary Langner is adjustment counselor at Carver Elementary School as a retirement. Uh, so we did get an additional retirement this month uh, and we'll be recognizing Mary uh, at our retirement reception in June. Um, the introduction I'd like to spend a little bit more time on is uh, Michael Schultz as the new uh, principal of Carver Middle High School. So Mr. Schultz, if you could come up, that would be great. Um, so we are pleased to announce um, Mr. Schultz as the next principal of Carver Middle High School. Uh, Mike has a master's degree in educational leadership from Bridgewater State College, he served as a teacher, uh, as a physical educa education teacher, and has been assistant principal athletic director at Carver Middle High School since 2006. Uh, Mike's had two successful terms as interim principal, uh, the position which he's currently serving. Um, he's really done a great job within that role. He's had a real vision for the direction that he'd like to take the school, and we're excited about having him move into the role. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the selection process. Uh, we had 31 people apply for the position. Uh, Christine Cabral and I reviewed the 31 candidates and selected six to be interviewed. We had several qualified candidates, um, in current, including some current principals and other uh, surrounding districts. Uh, we formed an interview committee of 18 people that consisted of students, teachers, parents, administrators, and one member of the school committee, uh, Mr. Solovoda. Uh, the committee selected three finalists. The finalists each had a site visit at the school in which they toured the school, visited some classrooms, uh, met with students, and had the opportunity to meet with staff after school, uh, then interviewed with me personally. Um, as part of the site visits, we asked students and staff to complete feedback forms for each candidate. Uh, Mike did a great job during the entire process, and I want to share some of the feedback uh, that we got from students and staff. Um, so a couple of the students' responses. Uh, he has great strengths. He's done a great job working with Alice, uh, experience in Carver. Um, he's working, well, interested in pathways, experience in uh, middle and high school sports. Uh, he wants to help improve, he wants to help work with people, he wants to help people with their lives and go on to college and get into the right work. He has some great ideas with career pathways, which really sounds amazing and I think can make a difference around here. A lot of good up upcoming ideas and has many connections with students. Um, overall, I believe Mr. Schultz is the best fit for principal. Uh, he's always really nice to everyone and he has a plan of where the school wants to go. Uh, great with staff and is an excellent communicator providing staff with important information. Mike knows the building and staff very well. He's accessible, communicates easily, handles difficult situations calmly, organized, and has a good sense of humor. Uh, one of his strengths is he is a wonderful communicator with staff. Uh, he's done a great job as interim principal. Uh, clear and consistent communication with staff, creative problem solving, presence throughout the building, always looks to support others. He's passionate about the school. He doesn't just want to be principal, he wants to be the principal of Carver Middle High School. He's self-aware in how he addresses students and situations. He's very approachable and friendly. He's sincerely vested in the interests of this school community and has a vision for our future both, uh, that's both visionary and practical. Uh, proven history as interim principal, assistant principal and athletic director. A positive can-do attitude. Uh, he successfully worked in the role over the last past few months and has respect of most many faculty and staff members. Uh, Mike's calm but efficient leadership is admirable. He's able to get things done and make progress quickly through efficiency and productive leadership. Um, Mike Schultz is a fit for our school culture. He believes all our students can find success. He considers all their learning differences. He's a problem solver. Mike gets things done. Mike is sincere and passionate about our school. He knows what it will take to be a successful principal in Carver and bring the new ideas that the school needs. Uh, so that, I mean, that, that wasn't all the responses. That was just kind of an overview of the responses from uh, faculty and staff who did the, did the, did the feedback piece. Um, so I'm just excited about Mike coming in. Um, I think he does have a vision of a direction he wants to take the school. And I wanted to take a couple minutes to introduce him to the committee. And uh, I don't know, so Mike, what are your thoughts? With that, with that introduction, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I guess I'm just really excited about the opportunity. We've been working on some new ideas and some new initiatives. Um, we're starting to share those with the students, um, the staffs on board, and just providing new opportunities and, and challenges for the students. They seem to be excited. Um, uh, and I'm looking very much forward to getting going um, and continuing the good work of our staff and our students, and I'm excited. Well, congratulations. Thank I mean, you. I think you'll, you'll obviously, with that higher praise from your <laughs> from your fellow staff members, uh, you'll do well. And it seems like everyone had your back on that. 
but um, yeah, it was overwhelming. Um, yeah. When we finally announced it um, last week, uh, my phone kind of blew up, and people were excited. And I'm overwhelmed and humbled by the support of the staff. Um, I don't know how many students know quite yet, but we're going to get that message out pretty quickly. And um, yeah, it's been great. That's great. Been great Any support. other comments? The general impression is he's our guy, and thank you for <laughs> letting us submit, even if we didn't go. I heard he killed it. <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet. But thank you. It's it's nice to have people who know this town and appreciate this town working in the positions that are going to matter. So, so congratulations. So, so as James found, I did I did share all of the staff and feedback uh, with you in a, in in the background. All right. Any, any, any other thoughts? Any other thoughts, comments? Right. No, I uh, representing <laughs> the representing the school committee on. Uh, you know, I got to see everyone that came through, and uh, I got to see how Mr. Schultz stacked up against the competition, and. Uh, he clearly separated himself with a vision. And that's exciting. It's exciting for us sitting here. It's got to be exciting for the parents and the students at home. I mean, you have somebody that's not going to be complacent, somebody that has a vision, and, and I know that it's going to walk right in and want to see that follow through. Um, so as a, as a parent with young kids, I'm excited to have them look at you and say, that's going to be my principal someday. So congratulations. Thank you. Nothing more to add. Congratulations, Mr. Schultz. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, move something up in the agenda, Mr. Chairperson. Um, so down the bottom was elementary school handbook. Uh, so at okay. this time, if that's okay with you, I'd like to uh, invite Tanya Dawson to come up and share the handbook changes. Um, the middle high school is still working on the handbook changes. That's going to come back at a later meeting. Uh, Tanya's changes are pretty minimal this year, uh, but we'll let, we'll let her take you through them. Um, just like Mr. Neve said, this year there's only four changes um, besides all the dates and the names that need to be changed. Uh, so on page two, our IMC student borrowing procedure, that's on the index. It's going to be changed to Coyote Book Collection. Uh, page 18, a, a quiet workspace free from distraction. We're going to change that to an area, a workspace that works for your child. Page 19, we're eliminating uh, number five, turn off music. Some children need to have music so while where, where is that referencing specifically where they have to turn off music? Oh, under the home, I'm sorry, under yeah. the homework, our suggestions for um, how to support your child with homework. Okay. And on page 21, uh, we're going to change the time from 8.25 to 8.15 since the students need to be in their classroom at 8.15. 8.15 is the beginning of the school day. So that's, that's the right. You should be tidy if you come in <laughs> after. You're after the start, yeah. <laughs> exactly. With you there. Without a 10-minute grace period. So very minor changes this year. Yeah, there were right. a lot last year. So. Yeah, there was. It was very yeah. Yeah. I think I came back twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments on Can I just make one comment? Just with the new election, can I be in here? The just that has the school committee. Oh yes, all, all the um, sure all to... names and all new names and all dates will be changed, That's and I, I will make sure to... that you are in there. Have a smiley face next to you. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> a smiley face. <laughs> you can draw a heart too if you want me to. I told him no. But... You told him no. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank I, you very much. Um, yeah, we did a motion. Yeah. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Second. Do I um? All, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, this time I'd like to invite up uh, Kim Duane and Sarah Chabonneau. Uh Kim Duane is our uh, Adjustment Counselor and Director of Guidance and Sarah Chabonneau is an Adjustment Counselor um, in our CAP-TAP program. Um, and Mrs. Ellis, yes. who's, who's, who's joining them is a testimonial, I believe. Uh, sorry, that wasn't on the... That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so uh, the CAP-TAP program is a program we've talked a little bit about here at the school committee. Uh, for our Carver Middle High School has been in operation for the past two years. It serves two student populations. Uh, first is the CAP, the Carver Alternative Program, which provides students with alternative pathways to graduation, including shorter days, online courses, internship opportunities. And then the TAP program, which is the Transition Assistance Program, assists students in transitioning back to a regular school schedule after a hospitalization or a social emotional crisis that's caused them to be out of school. Um, so they kind of give us an overview on what's happened in this pro these two programs in the last two years. Uh, so please welcome Sarah, Kim, and Ms. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so we just wanted to give you a little update, like Mr. Neef said, about what we've been doing the past two years. Um, so last school year, we established um, both the cap and tap programs. Immediately when the school year started, um, at the end of August, we initiated the CAP program, and that is that stands for the Carver Assistance Pro. I mean, I'm sorry, Carver um, Alternative Program. So those were that was mainly started with students that were brought back from out of district placements um, that had severe social emotional um, disturbances or issues that that they needed a, a separate, different alternative environment and Carver wasn't working for them as the, the, the regular environment. So we t brought those students back in the beginning of the school year and we started that CAP program. We took a little bit of time with the TAP program before we started bringing the students in for, for that particular program. That's the transitional assistance program that's modeled after um, a bridge program that was started in Brookline, Massachusetts uh, many years ago, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, but we wanted to really kind of define that program, set the program parameters, and really work in conjunction with the Bright Network before we started taking students into that program. So we saw our first student at the end of January. And we, we just saw a need for the program. Um, Kimberly Duane saw that um, uh, there was a, an increasing number of hospitalizations, and those students were struggling when they were coming back, and they needed more support. And then um, Karen Teichart saw an increase in students needing a different environment and we were sending more and more district students out of district and it would just be optimal to keep those students in district. Um, so as Mr. Neef said, the TAP program is the transitional assistance program. That's a bridge program that's short term and our main focus is to get those students back from a long absence back into their regular classes. So they stay with their original schedule that they had. We might make some minor adjustments if the student needs it but there, it's a really individualized plan. We meet with the, the students and the guidance team, um, Mrs. Duane and whoever the guidance counselor for that student is, and we come up with a plan of what makes sense most for that student. And then the TAP staff works in conjunction with the student, the family, the teachers, and the guidance staff um, to really get them back on track and back into their classes and caught up with any work that they've missed. Um, and that program, like I said, was modeled after a program that was started at Brookline High School in conjunction with the um, Brookline Mental Health um, Community Center. And they really, they, they set up this program that was working quite well. Um, other programs in Boston, other schools in Boston started to start similar programs. They formed a bright network um, where they now give guidance and support to other programs that, that are starting um, throughout the state. And now I believe there's um, over 100 bridge programs in existence. Um, and we work really closely with Bright as, um, as a support for us. They offer a lot of guidance um, for us individually. They come in and kind of work with us in, in our team and make suggestions and give us a lot of feedback about what we're doing. And then we also go to um, the regional meetings that they have with other schools. So we're able to collaborate and work with other schools and see what they're doing and what works and, and what might not have worked somewhere else before you know we do the trial and error at our place. So it's been really helpful to work closely with the Bright Network. Um, the CAP program is the alternative program. So that's basically a, a regular school environment is not working for those students for whatever reason. We are substantially separate. Um, we're in one classroom for both of those programs. The students that work in the CAP classroom traditionally work online on an Ingenuity platform, um, so they have a little bit of flexibility about what classes they want to take, how quickly they want to do those classes. Some students are able to work a little bit more quickly than taking traditional classes um, at the school with a teacher, teacher-led instruction. We do also offer um, some classes that are teacher-led and led by myself as well, so that students can kind of break up their day a little bit, and they're also they can also have internships outside of the um, outside of the school. Um, so with the TAP program, the tri tri I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> With the TAP program, we have served five students the first year. We, from January to June, like I said, we started a little bit later. We served five students within that time. Um, this school year, we've served 12 students so far. And of those 12 students, three were repeat students that we saw from, from last year. 
Um, and then currently we have six students that are using TAP for, um, for various levels of support. Some of those students are in our program for a few periods a day. Some students are in their regular, back in their regular classroom and they really just come to us for as needed support. Um, so again, that's really individualized depending on, on that student. Um, the CAP program, in our first year we served 11 students. As I mentioned before, five of those students were brought back from out of district placements. Um, five of those 11 students graduated from Carver Middle High School at the end of last school year. Um, one moved to the Gateway Dual Enrollment Program from which he graduated. One student moved to a different special education program at Carver Middle High School. One student transferred to MAP Academy. Two students moved out of district and one went to outside placement. That was last year. This year we are currently serving nine students and of those nine students, eight would have been out of district placements. Um, two of those students are set to graduate. One student is moving to another special education program within Carver Middle High School and the rest of those students were, um, we're assuming will return to the CAP program next year. Um, and then just to give you a little bit of background about the typically what we see with our students, the TAP students that come in um, usually have a diagnosis of anxiety or a mood disorder like depression um, or a major depressive disorder. Uh, we did have one student that came in after um, a, a surgery and missed a significant amount of time, but for the most part, the students that we see in TAP have anxiety or mood disorders. And then the CAP students, similar, we see um, a lot of students with anxiety in MDD stands for major depressive disorder. So there are 10% of our students in the CAP program currently have anxiety disorders. 40% um, of the students that we've served in the CAP program have a mood disorder, like depression, major depressive disorder. 20% um, of the students have ADHD, and then 30% have another diagnosis, like um, oppositional defiance disorder, um, reactive detachment attachment disorder, um, or PTSD was another one that was in there. And then the function of the TAP program for the students, some students we, as I mentioned, it's typically a re-entry program, so the students have been outside of school for a significant amount of time and we're helping them re-enter back into their regular schedule. So 56, um, a little over 56% of the students that are using the TAP program are using them as a re using the program as a re-entry tool. Um, but we do also use it as pre a preventative measure, so you know, Mrs. Duane and, or a guidance counselor might recognize that a student is really struggling and they're having a difficult time in school. Um, so before letting it get to a place where they need to be hospitalized or need to go into an outpatient treatment facility, we try to kind of set them up with some supports within school that might help to alleviate some of those issues. And then the CAP students. Um, this is just a, a little bit to show you. So from the students that we've served in the CAP um, program, 25% of those were brought back from out of district, so we, we were sending them somewhere else and we brought them back in and they, they stayed with us. And 40% of the students that we've served in the program um, would have been out of district placements under normal circumstances if this program didn't exist. And then the, the other 35%, the CAP program was just a better fit than a, kind of a traditional setting, school setting. So, um, with this data, we wanted you to be able to see the impact that these programs have um, on students and their, you know, different facets of their school day. And so w when it says for all SE students, that means all students at Carver Middle High School that are struggling with a social or emotional disability of some kind. And so you can see that, um, you know, it starts with the 2013-14 school year, and we had a really you know big rise in the amount of absences of those students from school and it started to decline when we opened the programs and then you can see there's a big difference you know since in the last two years since that yeah. those programs have been open um, and now we're looking at hospitalizations and so that includes both um, psychiatric like um, uh, overnight hospitalizations as well as day programs, uh, but again, the data is very similar to what you just saw where, you know, we had this sort of steady increase since the 2013-2014 school year, 
Um, it, you know, it peaked the year before the programs opened and then drastic decline since then. And again, we st obviously students are still, you know, some still require hospitalization. Um, but I, I think that the services that we're providing, we're also preventing some of that from happening, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, now we're looking at academic failures. Um, and again, very, very similar data. It goes, you know, it goes, there's a, this sharp increase. Um, and then we open the two programs and it starts to go down again from 2017, 18 to end this year. And then, I'm sorry, and then, and then number of tardies. Because again, um, if, you're, if you're not in school, even if you're there part of the day, but if you're, if you're late, whether it's an hour late or two hours late, you're still missing instruction. So, so these, these count to and obviously impact credits and all of that kind of thing. Um, and we're just seeing the same thing over and over again in all these different areas. And yeah, it looks like you just recreated the same slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, they're all different, but it's true, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, and then obviously dismissals too, right? So when, um, when kids are struggling and they, they feel like they don't have the support that they need in school, they call home and they say, please come get me. I can't be here. I can't stay here. Um, and, you know, it's disruptive for everybody. Um, and, but when we're able to, to give them the support that they need, they're able to stay. That's great. And then we just wanted to give you a little um, snapshot of our room. <coughs> so our, the room that we have um, is A107, and that room houses both programs, the, the TAP program and the CAP program. So we have a couple of different areas so that students have um, a place where they feel comfortable no matter if they're coming in and out of the classroom or if they're there all day. So we have kind of like a traditional desk area. Um, and then when at the next slide, couple of slides, I, oh, we have a comfortable area where students can sit. There's like couches and comfortable chairs. Um, if that helps them feel like a little bit more comfortable and able to do their work. And then we just have like another um, area that's, uh, that's kind of tucked away. So if a student wants some space, um, they have that option. We've also, since these pictures have been taken, have added in some um, partitions so that if, you know, if they <coughs> need more space and to kind of, um, feel like they need a little bit of a more secluded area, they have that option as well. And then my office, you can't really see it, but that door right there on the right-hand side, that's my office. So my office is actually in the classroom so that I'm available to the students um, the whole day. The other thing that's really nice is that it has an outside door. Um, so, you know, some students, if they're really struggling getting into the building, they can, you know, come in that way. And I know that um, Sarah has gone out many times to mm -hmm. cars to help, you know, help support students coming into the building. And um, when they know that they can come straight into that room, it's not as um, daunting for them, I guess, which is nice too. Um, and so Sharon Ellis is here, and we also have some writ written statements. We thought, um, you know, the most important feedback that we can get about the, the programs, um, God bless you, are on, you know, obviously the students, but also the, the parents and the mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. um, they're the, what this is for and the most important, so uh, we thought it'd be important for you to hear from them as well. Um, so my daughter, I think that's, you can hear me, right? Okay, I'll just lean forward a little bit. Um, my daughter is a 2018 graduate of the CAP program. Um, and over the course of her middle and high school years, serious social emotional needs, executive functioning issues, and poor self-esteem seriously impacted her ability to succeed in the traditional school setting. Um, during her senior year, various situations came to a head. Continued struggles, struggles with academics, emotional dysregulation, relationship issues, and a literal stumble on the path of life in the form of a fall that resulted in a broken ankle, turned an already serious situation into a critical one. Katie had every intention of dropping out of school, and if that didn't happen, it looked very likely that she would be failing most of her classes, preventing her from graduating on time. The CAP program saved my daughter, and I'll be honest, me, in many ways. Um, this program changed everything for Katie. The one-on-one -on -one instruction, the built-in classroom supports, and the constant encouragement Katie received helped turn Katie 
into a more confident, willing, and motivated student. With a great deal of support in school through the CAP program, constant support from home, and outside counseling services, Katie transformed from a possible high school dropout into a student whose last term of her senior year was the best she had ever had in the entirety of her middle and high school careers. It was an amazing thing to witness, the confidence Katie now had, the proof that she could be successful, the knowledge that hard work and dedication pay off, and the recognition that some of our greatest life achievements are born from our biggest struggles. These are all pieces of the foundation that Katie continues to build, which will support her as she moves forward into adulthood. Life is definitely still a struggle for Katie sometimes, but the beautiful lessons that she has learned as a result of her time in the CAP program continue to shape her today as she navigates this next chapter in her life. Without the program, uh, the CAP program, I would not be sitting here before you as the proud parent of a girl, oh gosh, I might cry here, sorry, who was able to realize her dream to walk across the stage and receive her high school diploma. I will be forever grateful to the amazing staff of the CAP program and for everyone who supported my daughter during her time at Carver Middle High School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, a, a writ written statement from um, another parent that I'm going to read, and then Sarah will read one as well. Our family dealt with the transition of returning to school twice, once before and once after the TAP program was instituted at Carver Middle High School. Our initial experience was not only disappointing, but also devastating for our child. Not all of the teachers attempted to allow our student to catch up with the class, but also held them responsible for learning the material on their own. Facing the stress of not understanding the class topics and projects, but also suffering the low test scores and grades was beyond the comprehension by some of the teachers. The lack of empathy only increased the depression and created a whole new set of problems. The grades plummeted and the total hatred of attending CMHS soared. We had enlisted therapy, family counseling, and medical guidance to help us through the sadness of our child. Luckily, upon the beginning to the new school year, the guidance department and the Carver Middle High School had a new and improved transitioning program in place. The principal and the guidance team had a whole new approach to what kind of experience the students would face when returning to school, and I am so grateful. The TAP program not only became fully engaged in the day-to-day -day adjustments that would be necessary for success, the program which includes help with homework most importantly advocated for the student. If for whatever reason the child was not catching up with the class, the TAP team member would actually reach out to the teacher. The TAP team knew how classes were going and what topics the student was struggling. They were able to negotiate with the teacher approaches to testing, studying, and expected projects. Although the grades and test scores obviously were improved by the intervention of the TAP team, ultimately the compassion the team and the guidance department had was the true success of the program for my child. During the adjustment period, my student was allowed to interact with the people they trusted every day at least once, but at the beginning, the re-entering period required more support and they were there. When class time and expectations were overwhelming, the TAP people stepped in and my child benefited greatly. I know the TAP program is available for students with various reasons for extended absence from school, but the approach seems to be very much tailored for the needs of these children. I am so thankful for all of the people we have been dealing with this year. Sometimes the positive results for these programs aren't clearly apparent, but this is an important program. I personally will be as supportive for the TAP group as I can be. Having experienced virtually no support and then to have this program in place, I can tell you it is necessary for the entire family but especially the child who would suffer enormous, enormously without the TAP folks. <coughs> One more. Um, and this was written at the end of last school year. Dear Ms. Holly, I'm writing to let you know how much I appreciate the TAP program that Carver High School has implemented recently. The program has been wonderful helping my child with their struggles this year. Ms. Charbonneau has been absolutely amazing in not only helping my child, but myself to navigate through this time. She has been great as a li liaison between my child's teachers to keep him on track to finish out their junior year. 
I feel like if this program were not available, my child would have suffered and probably not be finishing this year as strongly. Ms. Gonzalez and Mr. Doyle have also been wonderful. This program is definitely an asset to Carver High School for students like my child, and I'm grateful that they have been a part of it. Well, thank you, ladies, for presenting that to us. Uh, any comments from the committee? No, thank you very much. I think I just want, oh, go, ahead. go ahead, please, Jason. I just want to commend you because one thing that we've <clears throat> not seen in a lot of schools around is that SEL component, and that every teacher is a teacher of SEL, and I think what you guys have done is above and beyond what's what's happening in a lot of places. So thank you, and that's, that's great. Yeah, I think to my point, as a parent who has a student who's absent sometimes due to certain concerns and is also executive function, I think that's something that's really misunderstood. And especially for a lot of parents, it's frustrating to know how to deal with that. So working with a student who's out for a day or two here and there or three days, catching up with Jupiter grades is a, is a chore in its own. So for what you're doing with those students, I can't even imagine what it would be like long term to try and keep them up and get them caught up with that. So thank you so much for all the work you do with this program because it, it's, it's huge to, to the students, but really to the parents who are really trying to support and, and make things happen. It's, it's just enormous to know that that support is there as well. So thank you very much for that. And I would just like to recognize uh, Kim, Kim Shear and, and Karen Teichert. Um, I think the two of them, uh, even in, even at the end of my term as principal, as I shifted from the pr being principal to superintendent, were identifying this need. You know, the data showed that from Kim. We had all these students with hospitalizations. We had all these students with social emotional concerns, and, and the population was just really growing for us. And they identified that need and and responded to it. And the response became the creation of these two programs. Uh, and Kim and Karen really took the leadership in that. Uh, I'd also like to thank the staff um, in terms of Sarah and Lindsay Gonzalez, who's a special education teacher in the program, uh, and Mike Doyle, who was the has been the paraphernalia most of the time. Mike's currently doing a long-term sub. Uh, he wants his goal is to be an English teacher. Uh, and right now he's doing a long-term sub for us for uh, a maternity leave in English. Uh, but for most of the time, the program has been in place. That's been the core staff. Uh, so I just want to thank them for all the work that they've done. Uh, and it, ha it really has brought some tremendous benefits to the Calvary Public Schools and the Calvary Middle High School. And the reality is last year we had, and I think I reported this either last meeting or the meeting before, <clears throat> we only had one dropout last year. Uh, we want to have zero dropouts, uh, but last year we had one, which was the low. That's, that's the lowest dropout rate in, in the history of the school. Uh, and I mean, this year we're. I think there's been. We're gonna have more than one. It's not going to be a huge number, though. I think it's still on one hand. It's going to be under one hand. Um, and that, that's really our goal is we're trying to find uh, as many alternative paths as we can to assist and help students uh, reach graduation. And these two programs are, are part of that, that experience. So thank you. One of the thank things you for I, oh. approving <laughs> two oh, yeah. years ago. Thank you for saying yes. You can, you can open these. Well, I'm glad um, we did that, obviously. And I'm, and I'm very happy to get these updates on these, on these pro two programs because one of the things that people don't think about a lot, we talk about budget numbers and things like that, but anything we can do to keep our kids in the district and help them in the district and not send them to, to another town or another facility um, <coughs> not only helps the child to be around their own, all their, their peers and their friends, but it keeps the money in, in our district that we need. Um, and also, I, I think whatever we can do, and you, you've done, you're doing it to keep, like, as Scott said, keep kids here and keep them in the school on a path to graduation. I think that's so important because that one thing could be the 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 the, the road to take send one way in life or or, or another. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's it's incredible what you're doing right now. Um, the only a uh, little bit of concern was was the uh, on a security standpoint. What you said the uh, the door you can, kids can come in the dedicated another door on the side. Um, Maybe we can work with Scott uh, and Mike about just making sure the, the the security safety protocols are still being followed for that entryway. I'm I'm it's I'm sure still, they are, but it's yeah, in case it's, it's right. locked. So okay. it's a matter of if they're coming in, we, they're, they're let in. They would it's, have to be let in not, by a staff yeah. member. Would know they're a member of the program and yeah. let them in that door. So, okay, true. I just I, I I mean after what happens in the world these days, you right. kind of have to think this way, and unfortunately, but well, thank you, ladies. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to invite up Mr. Schultz, who, as long as he's ready, <laughs> we'll yeah. check with Mr. Bowles, make sure he's ready. The lighting issue at the, sta the stadium. Oh. Uh, 
<laughs> so Did not pay our bill. <laughs> the timer, the timer just shut the lights off in the middle of the game, so I'm trying to put. The oh lights no! Back on. Uh, would you like us to make a change in the order? No, uh, no, I'm good. You're good. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, next year at the middle high school, uh, we're looking to return seventh grade teams within our current staffing model. Uh, and Mike's here to talk about that a little bit about uh, where, kind of where that thought process has come from and, and how we're going to be able to accomplish that next year. Uh, I think over time there's always kind of been a goal. There's been a little bit of concern at the middle school that we did not have teams grades 6, 7, and 8. Uh, for many years we've only had teams in grade 6. Uh, but as we looked at our staff and we looked at student population, uh, we came up with a way to uh, return seventh grade team. So Mike's going to just talk about that a little bit for uh, next year. Okay. Why so lights I, back on? I think the lights are back on. I think I'm good. Um, so I thought I would start by kind of giving just a, a quick history of um, the grade six teams and then kind of where we are currently. So when I started um, 14 years ago, we were obviously two schools in one building. Um, we had um, a middle school principal, 6, 7, and 8, and we had a high school principal, 9 through 12. Um, and that was our model. So it was a true middle school model. We were part of New England League of Middle Schools, and 6, 7, 8 teams existed. Um, as part of a restructuring, a reduction in staff, um, we reorganized into one principal probably 10 years ago now. It was two, 2009, March of 2009, I became the principal. And the at the schools. time, um, <clears throat> because of the reorganization of staff, reduction in staff, we were not able to continue with the traditional middle school model of seventh and eighth grade teams. We still felt it'd be valuable for students uh, or extremely important for to keep the integrity of grade six teams um, as students transition from fifth grade to sixth grade. So we did keep the middle school model in grade six, but seven and eight um, was sort of pretty much adopting the high school schedule. One of the things that happened during that time under one principle is we went to one schedule. Um, it allowed us to do a couple of things which basically supported the reduction in staff. Some of our teachers that traditionally taught middle school were then able to cross over to other grades and we were able to sort of serve a need. Um, when we did that, I think it was beneficial for us as a building because some of our middle school teachers were able to teach different curriculums, the high school teachers were able to teach middle school. So it definitely helped sort of build the, the, the environment that we have now. Um, but I think we've always been trying to bring back seventh grade teams. Um, most recently, feedback from parents um, and teachers is that students as they leave sixth grade um, still are not ready for that complete independence of growing into, into seventh grade on their own. Um, the, the good thing about the seventh grade team model is it allows our teachers to come and plan. It allows our, our teachers to build interdisciplinary opportunities. Um, they have a better handle on students within their group, so they're managing student concerns. Um, they're sharing information about students, whether it be a family issue or a behavior issue. So there's that collaboration, there's that support, there's always somebody sort of watching students as they transition from class to class. Um, and the feedback from parents and, and, and teachers over the last several years is that students still need that support in grade seven. And um, so we've been talking about it for the last couple of years. We've been trying to find a way to support a seventh grade team model. Um, and still be able to operate as a building and, and sort of cover our other classes. Um, so this year we've come up with a plan um, to bring back seventh grade teams. Um, so if we could, we have a sort of a grid of how we've created this and I will say that this is still a work in progress in that we need to sort of fine tune sort of the off time pieces. So when they're off team, when they're going to their electives, we need to make sure that we're offering the right amount of electives and we're covering this. But if you look at that, that model, what we've come up with is, uh, and a lot of, some of this came from a department chair meeting and Mr. Neef was very involved in sort of figuring out how do we staff and how do we support three different teams with 80 different students, thereabouts. Um, so 
we, we will still have a traditional sixth grade team um, of about 80 sixth grade students. And then we would have, we would create a traditional seventh grade team with about 80 students. And then the, the last component would be, we would have a split sixth and seventh grade team, um, which is not too uncommon. Um, other schools have done this, uh, Plymouth has done this, Civil Lake has done this, where you have um, the same group of teachers teaching both a seventh grade curriculum and a sixth grade curriculum, which a lot of our teachers currently do anyway. So in that top grid there, you will see that, um, and we've, we've labeled the teachers that are gonna be there, but basically you'd have a seventh grade math class and a seventh grade science class run opposite a sixth grade English and a sixth grade um, geography class. Um, the, only, the only downside to the sixth grade split team, and it's not necessarily on the student's end, is that um, the common planning time wouldn't exist as well, so the preps would be sort of off, but they would always be that team element. So if you look at period four, there would be a team planning time, which brings back that concept of, of collegiality, <coughs> working with students, understanding the, the, the population of students that you have. Um, the, the reason why we've sort of clustered math and science together and English and geo is, is they would have common planning time and they would be that interdisciplinary opportunities which lends itself typically to math and science and English and, and history. Um, so that we would have a 40-40 split, so approximately 40 seventh graders and 40 um, sixth graders. And the only thing that we're really sort of working out now is the, the off-team time stuff, like the, the allied arts and the electives. Um, the split team would have some sixth and seventh grade allied art classes together. So there technically could be some sixth and seventh grade students in the same technology class, the same music class. Um, we wouldn't cluster them in health um, or phys ed, but ultimately some of the other allied art classes I think would be, would be clustered together. And in those classes, a lot of it is project based. So they're pacing themselves, they're working on projects. Um, we don't see a, um, a real issue with that. So although this is not completely finalized, what, where we are now in the process is we're running students through this. So we're actually putting kids into classes, we're gathering our class sizes, we're making sure that students have a place to be on their off team, we're incorporating you know, where they are for phys ed, band, and so forth. So you've got several layers of, of running this. Um, and we're, I think we're in round maybe six or seven in terms of where we are, but we're close to finalizing this schedule. Um, the teachers involved have been notified and they sort of know where they're gonna be teaching. And the next step would be communicating this more formally once the schedules are, are, are finished with parents in the community. And, um, and the, only, the only other piece I wanna add into this is, you know, this is something we thought about in terms of creating the split team concept or having three teams for two grade levels. Uh, and the question, or a question that may come in your mind is, is this sustainable? And it is sustainable because if you look at the elementary school in grades K through five, the classes there average between 120 and 130 kids. So we're looking at the pipeline at least for the next four, five, six years saying, we're gonna have the same about same approximately the same population. Obviously, there's going to be variations. So, you know, there might be a year that one of these teams has 87 or 88 kids on it. But in general, it's a sustainable model, a sustainable model for the next X number of years. And we said that ultimately, this is a model that we can create within our current staffing um, <clears throat> and, and then maybe provide better supports for students by having that team in the seventh grade. Uh, because the concept of the team is they have all the same kids have the same teacher mm -hmm. and those people can work together to support those students. Uh, and this, we've been talking about trying to find ways to bring back seventh grade teams for many, for a couple of years. It's a conversation that happens a lot. And then as we started to really look at it and said, this is a model that can work and be sustainable for at least the next six, seven years within the Cairo Public Schools uh, without changing our staffing. Because ultimately what was happening this year is some of those teachers were just, were teaching all of our sixth grade teachers were teaching one seventh grade class anyhow. Mm -hmm. And then some of those seventh grade teachers were teaching three or four seventh grade and an eighth grade. So we said if, peop if, so if teachers are teaching one seventh grade class anyhow as a sixth grade teacher, even our sixth grade team teachers were teaching one seventh grade class. We said we can, we can put this together and make it really a team structure for six and seven and, and Mike's taking the lead in doing that. And, I, and we're excited about it. We think it's gonna provide some uh, good opportunities for our kids next year in terms of improved service. And, and one, of the, one other 
piece of the scheduling component is that this is going to lend itself um, well to the the pathways <coughs> that we're trying to work on because you know you're bringing this the sixth and seventh grade students are going to have the support they need they're going to be in a team-based model they're going to be exposed to some of the allied art and electives that we're offering um, we're going to really have eighth grade look more like an exploratory year like we talked about so this this new schedule change allows us to do that and then one of the big changes um, that we've done on the middle school side in terms of scheduling is a lot of our electives were, were term based. So you get a term of something and then you'd go off term and you'd come back. We have structured the whole building around a semester based schedule. <clears throat> so these electives and these activities for the, for the sixth and seventh grade team model either be a red or green day. We do a red or green day, like A or B day. So one day you might be in phys ed, the next day you're in something else. Um, traditional middle school kind of environment model. For eighth grade, they're going to follow more of a high school schedule that's going to be semester based. Again, exploratory, get, taking advantage of some of the classes that we may be offering at a lower level at the Pathways program, but semester based. So our eighth grade, as they transition out of teams, and we think at that point they'll have two years of that support, they'll transition into a transition year with eighth grade where they're exploratory and they're getting a feel for what high school's like. And then as they enter high school, hopefully they'll decide a path that they want to go down and we start working on that career pathway part of it. Um, the other thing, just as a side, that we, we noticed and want to do is transitions between grade levels. So we do a transition between five and six because it's a shift in buildings. We haven't in a while done a transition between eighth and ninth, and I think it got lost because they're in the same building, so what's the transition? But there is a huge, there is a huge transition from eighth grade to ninth grade, and we've, we're, we're going to recognize that, and we're going to start working to do a freshman uh, orientation or something that helps that transition. So, this team model supports the eighth grade exploratory, then supports our overall vision of the of the of the graduate or, or the pathways, and um, I think it solves a lot of concerns for us. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Yeah. I think this is great. Um, I think there's opportunity here in that split team level where you, if you strategically pick the sixth graders coming in, that they may have the opportunity to loop also. Mm -hmm. So if you have this team, this, these students who might need familiarity with teachers over a couple of years, thank you. Um, and sorry, I lost my train of thought off that. But yeah, so it's just like taking that sixth, moving them into seventh with the same group of teachers that could. It, you know, you'll get that oh. SEL component. Yeah, we, we identify that looping's a possibility. We haven't said we haven't committed to that yet, but we just said yeah. that looping could be a possibility. But it's it's a built in here too. It's, yes. it's nice. So. Absolutely. Yeah, we've talked about that possibility. Yep. Anybody else? No. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Thank Schultz. You. Mr. Schultz. <clears throat> All right, uh, our next topic is the Sustainability Study Committee. I know we have the chairperson of the Finance Committee. Uh, Mr. Germain is here, so I don't yes. know if we want to invite him up. Alan, uh, uh, Alan would you like to come up to, uh, to speak on this? And then I know that there was a discussion about this at the uh, Finance Committee meeting on Thursday night, which uh, I went Mr. Catterall was present and, and Brad so went. Mr. Brothers. Yeah. So maybe, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Jermaine can give us an overview on what this committee is um, for the rest of the committee here. And uh, I know he's looking for possible participation from the school committee, um, as well as the Board of Selectmen. Um, and, and, and also, it'll be with the entire FinCom. So That's right. It's, from what you may have heard, it's not a target to the school department. We're not, FinCom has no control over your budget. We're well aware of that. You guys are an island all to yourselves. <clears throat> but in the overall picture of the entire fiscal responsibility of the whole town of Carver, and that's all of it, that's all $40 million of it, we're looking at the sustainability going forward. We know that a couple years from now, there's going to be a challenge with the school department's budget in the contractual obligations. We know there are a lot of wants and needs from the local, from the town, from their departments. Um, we have a new opening in planning that occurred today. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of stuff. We, th th I know that the chief would like to have a deputy chief. I know that the DPW is short-handed. I know that there are some departments within this building that are short. 
So everybody has a need, everybody has a want, everybody has a wish list, and one of the things we're doing as a full member, as a full committee for the first time in a long time on the Finance Committee is I like to ask every department that comes, what's your wish list? So, because it's a balance in that. You guys know that. You guys know that, that you, you, <laughs> you go into your meetings and you dance on the head of a pin trying to make it work. And last year, this last season, we, we helped you guys to make it work. And, and I'm glad we did, and I still will stand by it was the right thing to do. I just don't want to have it be a problem two years from now, and I don't want to start seeing layoffs. So we're looking at the whole big picture of what can we do here? Where are we going planning-wise? What is the revenue forecast? What's the tax levy going to be? Um, Stephen Cole asked me a very interesting question, and I'd like to pose it to the school committee. And he's the town planner. He's the, well, up until today, oh, he gave he, his notice. He so oh, he, will, oh. he will be departing, sadly. Um, okay. But he asked me, he says, there are two things facing the town going forward. He says, the first thing is the old guys like you. I said, thank you. Um, can we stay here when we retire because of the tax base? But the more important thing to that was go ask the seniors and the juniors what are their plans? When they graduate, if they don't go on to college and they stay with mommy and daddy and they decide, you know, they get a job and they move out, can they afford to stay in the town they were brought up in? Or do they do like a lot of them do, have to go off someplace, live in a third floor tenement, and then 15 years from now when they're married and they got a couple of kids, try to move back into the town because they want to come back to their roots? What's that in between? And why can't they stay? Why can't they afford to stay? Same thing if you go off to college and try to come back. So we're looking at the big picture, the whole big ball of wax. And it's not just tomorrow's numbers, it's tomorrow's and, and two years and three years and five years. And everything is on the table as far as we're going to compile data, which is where Brad is so incredibly helpful, as is Meg LeMay because we are useless without the data. We'd like to have a representative or two from the school committee, and we'd like to have a representative or two from the selectmen. Um, they will actually become part of that voting board, if you will, but one vote per for the selectmen, one vote for the school committee. And I wanted to include the entire um, finance committee because I did, we got a lot of new people on it. We have some very experienced people on it. Uh, in August, we have Pat Maha coming on. We have Steve Pratt on it now. We got um, three new gentlemen that have come back to Carver with their families. So, and, and plus the cranky old ones like me and Bill Duggan, and, you know, which is good. So we have a, a pretty good balance. Um, Beth Selger is the finance director for South Shore Hospital. She deals with a larger budget than the entire town of Carver, which she kind of finds comical. So she's a wealth of knowledge. Um, Kate Banzel's our vice chair. She's been a lifelong Carver resident. So we have a real diversified finance committee this year. It's, it's, this, it doesn't lean in any direction. It leans in the direction of just trying to be responsible. So that's where we're at. We'd like your input. We can't do this without you. Um, if there's any voting, and, and I'm sure this is going to cross your mind, what are the votes? It, it would simply be to bring a program back to your group. Or if it was a, something that would work town-wide, it would be a program to bring to town meeting or a program to bring to a department head meeting. So it would be. And then we start to add it all up and try to figure it out. We're trying to come up with a solution so that we can go forward and sustain where we're at. We'd, we'd love to get involved in that letter writing thing you're doing. I think finance committees should be involved in that statewide also. Why aren't the finance committees writing to these representatives kicking and screaming about, hey, where's our state aid? 
was on money for the schools. This impacts the finance committee as I much can, as it impacts I the school committee. I can give you a committee. copy of a letter and you can bring it <laughs> to them and send it off. Give me a copy of the letter. I'll have nine people sign off on it with the finance committee. I have no problem with that. The more we can work together, the school committee and the finance committee can work hand in hand, the more we can accomplish. And I have no problem with doing that. So if I can help you guys, I'm all for it. If you guys can help us, we'll certainly reach out. Um, and that's where we're at. We'd like to have a, you know, one or two members that want to be involved. Brad is going to, I assume, uh, is going to be at some of the meetings, and you will uh, furnish some of the, the, the information so that we're not playing in the dark here. I don't like dealing with false numbers. I don't like dealing with I don't knows, I'm not sure. I like to have concrete information so that the whole committee can make an intelligence decision. You can't make decisions on, geez, I think it was, I, it might have been, I'm not sure yet. You, you can't do anything with that. So. All right. I mean, this is something that started long before, you know, not long, but before I was on the committee, meeting with the selectmen, you know, trying to have a joint um, meetings with the selectmen and the school committee to have the, the two committees work better together because we all know that these two committees weren't. Well, there was, there you know, was a few years yeah. of. of things that weren't going very well right. and and that joint session was really started as a non-formal session right to be about just making sure that we're communicating and, and realizing each other are people and talking to each other because the, you know and, and just eliminating the stigma I get where it comes from because I understand and when you're talking about that budget these guys you want concrete man these guys have to deal with variables that change every time the wind moves a different direction so there aren't a lot of constants you're probably going to get because a lot of things do drift and change but I think the, you know we're one community man everything that comes out of my pocket your pocket right. their pocket it all goes to the same thing it's not the school in the town it's it's everybody and, and you guys hear the same thing that I hear. We, we do. And, and I, but I will tell you, as a parent, I mean, I, you know, when, when we, if, if you're a parent and even, you know, if your kids are older and grown up, you're still spending money on your kids no matter how old they are. They're the biggest part of your budget no matter what you're looking that's at. That's right. So right now the schools are a big part of our town budget because that's kind of how life goes, you know. And, and I, I think I've always been a fan of any communication. I was one of the ones that promoted that joint committee because yeah. – if we're not clear on understanding each other and where we're coming from, we're never going to get anything done. That's right. If we're always building up walls and, and trying to say your side, my side, this is one town. That's right. And, and we've got to come up with more concrete conclusions that way, which I think I fully agree with you on. I think my biggest concern is, is just the voting aspect of it. I, I'd, rather see a, I'd rather see no voting authority given to any, any members because... I think it's more for policy, Jim. It doesn't really have anything to do with a, a dictatorial type of a thing where we're going to take a vote where you guys will trim 5% off your budget and we'll trim 2% off of it. It's not going to come down to anything like that because we don't have that authority. We don't have right. that control. Right. I think it's more for policy making. That's the only reason it probably well, shouldn't even, it'd probably be more of a consensus than it's ever going to be a vote. To my point, though, your committee is all there, so there'll be a consensus. You're asking one voice to be a consensus for the other four people that aren't there. So I don't know if that's necessarily a, like, no matter how it works out, if, if somebody from the school committee votes on that, it's going to be perceived that that's the way the school committee voted. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's what I would I would hope. Well, but how would we know if only one member is voting and not representing with everybody's voice? Do you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm assuming that you guys pretty much all are on the same page with stuff, aren't you? Well, we just had a budget vote a few months back. We were three, to three, three to two. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I thought by the, by you uh, talking about voting was um, voting a consensus for suggestions yeah, to go back to the it. certain uh, the specific committees in town right. or boards in town and if like if something if they voted to, for something whether they vote or not i mean that's fine but, but here's it, my point you're voting as the school committee rep so right. regardless of that's just your voice and i'm not against i'm just trying to rationalize the whole thing that's being set up you're going to vote and and andy carter andy carterelli votes yes well what if three school committee members don't and agree with Ultimately, that? anything that was voted on there would have to be voted by the school committee right. first. That's yeah, no, no, right. I understand. Well, yeah. I understand. This is a public meeting also, well, no, so, I, you know. Well, the school committee reps, if it's something about the school committee, they could abstain from the vote. 
And if you know, well, but we, that's what the whole thing is. I mean, but I mean, like said, thing, but if that's, that's your concern, we'd still bring it back to the. We still bring it back to the school committee. Well, but here's, I guess, to my question, because and I'm, I thank you for coming tonight. I'm very glad you showed up and you're here to answer these, man. Um, it's it's really not even a subcommittee, right? Is what no. I've been told. It's just FinCom. No. So I just it, it to was going to be a subcommittee, and 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 uh, the town administrator and I. Those that know me know I'm real big on fair, right? And I didn't think it was right to bring in what amounts to five new members to the finance committee, and then say, by the way, we're going to do a subcommittee with the school department, and it's going to be uh, five people, and you guys can't be on it. Right? So, it, it, you know, you don't want to do that. So um, there'll be other participation. There's going to be. It's still going to be a public meeting. I really would prefer to have the whole thing come out as like a roundtable discussion more than anything else. Okay. I really don't want it to be a finance committee meeting. Okay. Um, we may have our finance committee meeting and then adjourn that meeting and go into this it still will be a public session but i don't think i want to have it be a quote formal meeting i'd rather have it be a roundtable workshop that's kind of what the intent of the joint school committee selectmen were and and as as it progressed, it got sort of distorted because of what people expected to get from it and whether it's going to be televised or not. And really, the whole intent was to get the selectmen and the school committee together yeah. to start talking to each other. That's exactly it. And so I guess, it, you know, the, the, it, it's the same idea. It's the right idea. We have to, you have to be careful about how it gets sort of, well, you can't do that like that. It has to be public this, and it has to be televised, and not in that room. It'll and, be, a, it, it'll so. be a, a advertised public meeting. Right. Because you can't have that kind of a, a quorum set up and not have it be that. So I have no problem with that. I'm not sure it's going to be recorded for posterity. I think right. we're going to have a recording secretary to take the notes. Um, we have a wonderful new girl, that, um, and Mary Ann, of course. But uh, we have uh, Kelly DeCarly, who just got uh, hired in to do the ZBA notes. And, and she did them for one meeting. And I scooped her right up and had her do it. For was that the, the woman uh, that was ill at yes. the last meeting? Yeah. She was here at the last meeting because, and I'll say this on TV, uh, Mary Ann was at a golf lesson. So uh, I texted her back and I said, golf? Question mark. Really? Question mark. But that's how I got Kelly. Well, so I have um, to say, Alan, I, I had the opportunity to work with you on that solar by that second solar bylaw committee. And I, I think that was an excellent committee. And I think everybody was really focused on trying to come out with the right conclusions. And, and I know you have that mindset. So, I mean. Yeah, I want us all to be on the same team. There's, there's, you know, there's, we're too small a town to have it be the FinCom versus the Selectmen versus the, the, the school committee. There shouldn't be any versus. It shouldn't be any versus anybody. You know, it's, it's, it, there's one tax levy, there's one pot. And out of that, you guys get a piece, and we get a piece, and the state tries to reimburse a piece, and we try to put that all back into the pot and make a meal. So there's no reason why we can't try to do this together, which is a whole lot better than you guys trying to do it. Then you got to bring it back to us, and then it goes back over to the selectmen, and it's a you know, it's it's back and forth, and and who needs that? We're not the city of Boston. We're not New York. Do you know what would you be looking for? for informational purposes from the from our committee i think we already have it i have a a current budget from from uh, from brad i'd like to see we're going to actually this coming meeting um we're going to run some on the 23rd the next finance committee meeting we're going to touch on it quickly um to get like some basic a, a baseline for some numbers and start to crunch some data we're going to ask meg uh, I'll probably ask Brad, but I want to have the committee give their input. Uh, it's not going to really be the start of this yeah, yet. I was gonna ask, to, what is this meeting? What is this group going to start? We're going to decide that on the 23rd. This one here, I'm working on the grant program for the nonprofits and stuff, so we can get that rolling because it really should have had their approvals if it had been at town meeting. So yeah, we're trying to. The only other, I know, I don't want to get caught up on the whole June. Vote, the whole just for you. The whole vote concept, but I want to ask a question about voting. So you said if there were two school committee members there, they would have one vote. So my assumption would be the finance committee gets one vote, not each individual member. Of the I'm not committee. sure how uh, that's at this point in time. I'm not objecting to that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. I don't. I guess that was just my concern. If you're talking about, well, you don't want to be 11 or 11 against one. Sure. Right. Right. Oh. Right. right. You know. I understand that. 
I, I'm not. We're not trying to stack that deck. Well, and, it, and I guess my concern isn't even eleven against one because if it were, then you know, it would be <clears> clear <throat> that the school committee member is standing up for something that they believe in. My concern is more that one member is representing the voice of five in a way that they may not be necessarily representing that voice. Oh, I'd like this committee to pick two people that'd like to be on it, then how's that? Well, I think I think what James, I think to your bigger point is you want whatever suggestion is coming out of the FinCom to come, come back, back to this first. committee because we are our own sovereign entity. Well, so to by, vote on I guess to my point, if that school committee member is a voting member, <clears throat> that it is brought back here for discussion before an actual before you represent that right. vote. But see, the vote would probably be for you to take it back to the school yeah. committee. That's all I'm trying to say is that right. kind of voting is going to be consensus based. Right. So the vote well, would only be. Do we want to go through with this study all in favor? Do we want to go through with this kind of a study all in favor? Do we want to go and look at first student taking over the buses all in favor? That kind of stuff. We have no authority to come back and tell you guys what to do with five cents of your budget. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to come up with a consensus to sustain going forward the entire town budget. Well, I can see James's point on that, though, is that if the two school committee members, whoever they are, vote on it to bring it back to our committee, it almost seems like you're approving the idea the school for the school committee. The idea. I would you know, expect if you hated the idea, you would vote in favor of bringing an idea back to this committee. Yeah, I think I we, I think, if you hate the program, I think you're if still going to bring it back. If it was back worded that way, just well, to bring it back to, again, for discussion. That's, sure. Yeah. So that's really the key, Andy, is how that vote is worded. Right. It's, you know, what it's connected to. I right. still like the idea of representing to this committee before you make any actual votes, yeah. um, because then you have input and feedback that way. I agree way, with that. I don't have a problem with that either. And it's a public meeting, so if you have two representatives that are on that committee and the other two want to come, by all means. Right. I don't have a problem with this. We load the, the room up. I got no problem with that. I'm more the merrier. Do we, do we have any other discussion on this one? So the value of the vote would symbolize, uh, as you mentioned, like the buses, for an example. For example. So, yeah, for an example. Okay, so if the the... We, are we calling a subcommittee? If if this other committee decided, sustainability yep, sustainability committee. committee, we like that idea. Then it comes here to us, and the, the sustainability committee believes we should take a look at this. Then we look at it and we decide, nope, we don't like it. it then just you dies. come back to us and say we don't want to so, do it. So really, those votes just symbolize right. time. Yeah, but I will. I, but time, I will be honest with to you. Some, to another committee. Well, but we I, would yay or nay it at this point anyway. Good. If that were the case, and let's use the buses for an example, yep. if the, the, the group requested that they bring it back to the school committee that we look at maybe first student taking over the buses. Now, I know you've looked into that in the past, but maybe this time it's a good deal. And you guys decide, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to keep our own buses, leave status quo just the way it is. doesn't mean that we still can't go look into that. We can go look in it. We just can't do anything about it. We can't, you know, come back and tell you guys, hey, we looked into it anyway against your wishes, and this is what we found, and we're going to go forward, and you have to do this. We don't have that authority. Well, we can still look into it. Yeah. You can't stop us from looking into it any more than we can force you to do it. So, but I don't want it to become that adversarial. I want us to work together on it. Yeah, so, but I'd it, say it is that adversarial. I mean, it's really at that point in this conversation. You know, we're our, you're basically taking a line item and saying, well, we can look into it. Yeah, you can look into any of them. But we could just keep moving down the list. And we right. could, every meeting, come up with, you know, let's look at janitorial services. Look, look at this. You know, and then it's like a redundancy to Brad. You know what I mean? Hey, you've already looked at this, but we, you know, us 13 decided you need to look at it again. And you've got to come back. And so it becomes. It's not, it's not going to turn into something like that. It's not. Okay. I have well. far better things to do than to get into that kind of nonsense. Well, I guess the, my concern, part of it is like what you're talking about when you're saying we've looked into that, we've done that. I mean, how much of that comes back to Brad where, you know, FinCom is looking for, because the, the educational budgeting system is very different and there are a lot of different requirements, mm -hmm. which is why we have that's right. Brad. And that's why we are gonna we would rely on, on him providing us with some information. But so to Brad's extent, how much does that mean Brad is going to be teaching FinCom about educational budgeting because he's got a lot to do within his own structure? I think I he'll guess, have a way. lot you know of teaching I mean? to do. We got, we got, we got um, Pat Maha, mm -hmm. who was a... Uh, uh, oh, I know Pat. All right, so... And Steve Pratt. 
you know, and Steve Pratt. So I mean, we we got some some pretty sharp people that are on the committee. I would I would rely on Brad just to provide us with the raw data. He doesn't have to come in and give us a class. No, I'm I'm not implying it that way. Alan. I I just think that a lot of the issues and concerns and questions you're going to have are going to be things that Brad is either dealing with on a regular basis sure. or, or has already dealt with. And in fact, you mentioned something about putting something together um, prior. Yeah, we could. Just an outline of basic things we've looked into in the last couple of years. Um, just busing is a perfect example. I just got a spreadsheet the other day of what everyone else is paying around. That's all contracted out. Um, and again, we below that number out of the water internally. Perfect. I mean, I think transparency is always a good thing. And I, I think part of this is from serving on the FinCom for a long time before I joined this committee, it was a totally different set of people in these positions. So there was a lot of distrust that, go, that, you know, that goes back to those before those meetings started. And I think part of that, and we'll say being on Allen's side of the, of, the, of, the, of the room on that side, there, there is like a little bit of a mystery of the school budget, you know, and I can understand kind of where they're coming from. I have no problem with transparency as long as they understand that those numbers do shift they're not set in stone I until understand. like later in the year. We don't get numbers from the state. Uh, well, I was referring to accurate numbers. In that I time frame you were talking about, there's far more transparency between these oh. two gentlemen than, than exists. Oh, of course. Oh, there was. I was on the FinCom. We couldn't get any numbers from the school. And and Alan, oh. to your accord, I, I I know that the full intent of this is cooperation and right. to try and. Right. It's not about attacking in any way. I really think it's to bring everybody together really to come up with the best conclusions right. because we know as a town. We're kind of looking at a dark tunnel coming ahead with, with what's going on financially. Unless there are solutions, we're going to be running into some problems. That's right. Guarantee. I think and that's the biggest piece of that is, I guess, at the end of the day, we need to find out as a town, what can we do to improve our revenue streams? Because every, that's the issue everywhere, that's right. both town and school side. That's right. Um, and so your implication is those, yeah. all of that, everything is I, on the table. I wanted somebody on from planning on this committee, and yeah. they thought I was nuts. No, I, I would rather see more involvement. I would love to see other voices there. Planning is the income you know? side of the equation, yeah, right. I, I, I just, think. I think someone from planning should have been writing letters to companies to try to get them to come to Kava for years. I mean, that's the income side of the <laughs> equation. Mm -hmm. Planning is the ones that are planning and development. They know what's coming. They know when it's coming. Well, the properties are what's available. What's in the pipeline, what's available. Sure. I think they ought to be a part of it if I was overruled. I think that's crazy, but okay. So before, um, okay, I'm, but that's where we're the... that's where we're going with this. We want I, I want to I want all the information I can get mm -hmm. so that exactly what Jim just said. And and you know we we don't want to talk about the elephant in the room, but we don't want to talk about overrides. We don't want to talk about layoffs. We don't want to talk about uh, regionalization. We've already been through that and we undid it. So why would we ever want to go back to it? Right. So we need to find a way to make it happen on our own. Just built a new school. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So any, any further discussion on this? Would we be open to having Brad be our representative and being able to come back to town us with employee. the information? Town employee. That was overruled already by the town administrator. Feel free to. Ruled by the town I don't think Brad necessarily needs to be a... a well, he's already going to be there representing the, the factual data right. side of it. Right. And then if the vote is, in essence, a no vote anyway, because it's coming back to us anyway for a vote, so anything that's actually voted on there that has anything to do with us has to come through all five of us anyway. I think I'd rather have a, at least one member of the committee. But that's what he's saying. Yeah. Brad and one member of the committee is what you're saying. Oh, I thought you were just saying just Brad. Well, I was saying Brad be the be the voice so of. You're, you're saying the town administrator doesn't want any town employees, so including himself. Well, because he, himself, they won't Brad. be voting. That's why. I I think there's no I, honestly and truly. I don't see where there's a need to vote on anything. I think yeah. it needs to be a consensus, and that's it. If we're going to tie things up with you can't decide without running back to this committee, right. but they're not meeting for another three weeks, and we're going to have another meeting in two and a half weeks. Now we can't do that because you guys haven't met yet. And the next thing you know is we're playing with this thing in January. And, 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 you know, then we're in the middle of budget season and the whole bit, and who wants to deal with that? You know, I don't make a career out of this. I just want to make it so we can look at it to see what we're going to do. This shouldn't take, you know, this shouldn't be an ongoing 
two-year study. I don't want it to become that. So I don't want us to get bogged down in the voting end of things. There's, we, the Finance Committee has no control no, over no, what you, you guys do what whatsoever. You use the term, what we're going to do. And so, then you mentioned there'd be a vote. Okay, so what we're going to do, then coming with a vote. Be more of a procedural thing. Do we want to look into something? What do you guys think? But I would also tell you that I would envision most of these things are already looked into. I'm sure. So that's why I'm saying if, if you just had Brad there, could already say, well, we have looked into it, and here it is, all the information. I'm not really sure it, what him coming to the meetings and saying, all right, this is what I think, and then he just comes the next month and has to show us, and then we vote on it. Mm -hmm. What was his say? It, it was like a meaningless vote. Or what well, did it mean? You could bring up the discussion before on the question to come back to us if it's something that's actually worth doing. You know, we've experienced these things, you know, on an ongoing basis for years now. Um, Brad being there for sure would be a, a definite help, you know, because he has he has the actual numbers in front of him every yeah. day. I mean, I would have no problem participating in, or having two people from our committee participating in this discussion and with the with the knowledge that anything that is suggested for the school committee business comes back to the school committee. Well, well, well that has to happen, right. yeah. Right, so that, but that, that has to be an understanding on that. I mean, what is the will of the committee here? Do, do, do we want to make a, a motion to participate in this committee? I, I, would, I would make a motion of participation. I think, you know, we should be, I don't know how you want to uh, clarify who those representatives would be and if you want to get into that tonight or maybe see what Mike's opinions are about Brad or whoever being a part of that and and you want to try and table for the ne uh, next meeting and discuss it or I, I mean as Alan to Alan's point I don't want to put anything off but it seems to make sense until there's just a little bit more clarity as to what would be but I, I mean I don't think there's any contention that we w will be involved right I, I, I have no problem with us being involved yeah, and I think Stephanie should be here for the vote. She's, she could be, I mean, we were a 3 2 budget vote. I'd rather have all five of us here for that vote. Well, for who's five gonna, people. For who yeah. the representative's going to yeah. be. Okay. So you can make a motion to participate, and then we'll figure out who the representative is. Yeah, yeah well, we, so that's the, all. You that, guys can yeah. decide who represents within yeah. yourselves. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a public meeting. You right. guys are all welcome to right. show up. I mean, I have a problem with that. All right, so would I have a motion so to I, participate in this uh, sustainability committee? We can all show up, but they have to be with two, about two members. Not acting as a body. I would, I would make a motion. Otherwise, to, it's a public meeting. Uh, for the school committee to support and be a part of the sustainability study committee with two member representatives, one voting. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Jason. Sorry, Gina, I was speaking. Did you get that kind of. motion? <laughs> James made the motion. Yeah, and yep. Jason seconded it. Yep. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Cool. Can I ask so, a oh. clarifying question? That was a motion to participate. Participate. With two representatives, two representatives one, vote. one voting. Thank you. Yep. In the sustainability, we just haven't picked two of those people yet. Right. Huh? Yeah. yeah, we just have to pick uh, two members. That's, right. That's fine. You just got to pick them. That's up to you guys. You can draw straws or something. Yeah. Short right. straw wins or loses yeah. or however you want to go. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alan. Me on the end of Jermaine because everybody makes them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you look good to Andy Catarelli. You guys. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, moving on, teacher evaluation system. Okay, teacher evaluation system. So as uh, Tammy referenced in her comments from the APC, um, <clears throat> we've had, and it was part of our contract that was ratified by the school committee in January, we agreed that I would set up a committee to review the teacher evaluation system. Uh, the goal of the committee was to recommend revisions to the system to be ratified by the APC, which they've done, uh, and the school committee by June, and we're hoping to have ratification by this group this evening. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of take you through uh, the system. I have I provide you the entire language in the background, uh, so you do have the full document. Uh, but I'll just kind of do a, go through an overview of where we are um, and what we've done. Uh, so first of all, I thank the members of the committee. Uh, all the names are up on the board. Uh, for sake of time, I won't read through all the names uh, of everybody who participated in the committee. Uh, we did meet several times. We met four four days uh, and they were full day meetings uh, so it, we did it as release time uh, we did it actually in the make peace literacy center in the at central office uh, and 
Um, there was a lot of rich and good discussions in those meetings. I really think they were valuable. Uh, the general consensus of the group is that the, uh, the group worked well together. So I just want to thank all the members of the group uh, for their input, for their insight, uh, and for their perspective. And I think everyone's perspective came into the final document. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take you through um, legally what has to be in the evaluation system. Uh, there's going to be a lot more detail on the slides than I'm going to necessarily reference as I go through the slides. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what modifications we've made in the system that we still feel comply with the overall legal structure of the law for the new education evaluation system. Uh, <clears throat> so um, in essence, the evaluation system uh, this is this is a DESI slide. There's five bullets there for the purpose of the evaluation system. It's one of the things we looked at at the beginning of our process. And, and, and we kind of identified two of those five bullets as really important to us, and those are the two that are highlighted. We said we wanted to work on a system that promotes the growth and development of teachers uh, and places student, learning, student learn, learning at the center. And we had concerns about the current system and whether uh, those two things were always the focus. Uh, and maybe we felt like there were some ancillary pieces that were the focus. So part of our revisions and part of our proposals this evening uh, hopefully will tie back to that concept of uh, promoting the growth and development of teachers and placing student learning at the center. Um, so <clears throat> the evaluation, I'm just going to kind of take you quickly through the cycle of what's required. Uh, Self-assessment and goals, uh, each educator must develop an educator plan. Uh, the educator plan has to have one professional practice goal, uh, one, starting, one student learning goal, and outline the actions on how you obtain the goal. And that's a requirement of the law. Every, every teacher educator needs to do that. Um, everyone, it's based on four standards of effective teaching. Uh, curriculum planning and assessment, teaching all students, family and community engagement, professional culture. Everyone's measured against those four standards. Uh, one of the large discussions we had was the rubric. So DESE has defined rubrics for kind of each profession, whether it be teacher, uh, support assistant, superintendent, principal, administrator, uh, school nurse, there's an ancillary piece to it. So each component of the school, DESE's established a rubric uh, on how to assess these four standards of effective teaching. Uh, and we had a little bit of discussion of, you don't have to use DESE's rubric. You can modify it, or you can create your own rubric of how we're going to measure uh, these four standards. But after discussion, the group decided uh, that we would keep uh, the DESE-defined uh, rubrics. So we're staying with DESE's rubrics. Go ahead, Brad, uh, my, my page ahead. Oh, yep, OK. Uh, educator evaluation. So <clears throat> everyone has to establish two goals. Uh, and then halfway through the process, they have to have a formative assessment. There's a lot of words up there. Uh, the quick summary of that is teachers can be on a two-year plan or a one-year plan. If they're on a two-year plan, the formative assessment happens at mid-cycle towards the end of the first year. If they're on a one-year plan, that formative happens uh, in the middle of the cycle. We're going to talk about formative evaluation a little bit, formative assessment, uh, because we changed some things around the formative assessment. Uh, but I'll get to that when we get it. It is re it's a required part of the pro so required part of the evaluation system everyone has to have a formative uh, everyone has to have a summative evaluation um, some evaluation provided to the plan uh, some teachers have a self-directed growth plan and that summative evaluation has to happen after a two-year cycle you could, a teacher can have a one-year self-directed growth plan with a summative at the end of one year uh, they could have a directed growth plan which is uh, generally, the summit is at the end of one year, but it could be a shorter period of time. A teacher could have an improvement plan. So the way it basically works is that most of our teachers without professional status, and this is a generalization, there, there are other categories you can be in, but this is a broad brush for general perspective, is that our non-professional status teachers, teachers in year one, two, and three are on one-year plans. And they have a formative midway through the cycle, January or February. And then our teachers with professional status in general are on a two-year plan where they have a formative at the end of the year. And that's all required as part of uh, the law. The other piece that's required is evidence. And we're going to talk about some of the changes that we made in evidence. So. The law requires that teachers provide evidence against the evaluation system, evidence of how they're achieving their goals, evidence of how they're performing against the four standards. Mm -hmm. uh, and DESE came up with a model system for evidence that we adopted when we first brought 
the system on board and we're going to see that some of our recommended changes is going to be around evidence because that was a evidence was just a huge piece for everybody yeah for the, the evidence piece was overwhelming for the teachers the evidence piece was overwhelming for the administrators uh, and it, it was a part of the system that was creating a lot of uh, anxiety on both sides uh, so we've made some changes there but I'll get to that when we get to the changes but the law requires that the teacher provide evidence on goals and performance against the standards um, in the end Every teacher at their end of their, their cycle, their, their summer evaluation, whether it be a one-year plan or a two-year plan, uh, they get one of these ratings. Uh, exemplary, proficient, needs improvement or unsatisfactory. Uh, the same ratings that you've done for me as superintendent, uh, those ratings are the same no matter what your role is within the educational system. Uh, to be rated proficient overall, a teacher shall at minimum have been rated proficient in curriculum assessment and curriculum planning and assessment and teaching all students. So those two standards are specifically related to like almost classroom teaching uh, you have to be proficient in there to get an overall rating of proficient and that is in the law uh, and then at your end of your summer rating you can be placed on if you're exemplary or proficient you stay on a two-year plan if your needs improvement you go to a directed growth plan if you're unsatisfactory you go to an improvement plan so your rating at the end of your plan determines what your next plan is mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's just like a basic broad big big picture overview of this how the system works these are things we have to do you have to have the goals you have to have a formative assessment you have to have a summative you have to have one of these ratings you have to be rated against the four standards and then after you have your rating you end up in one of these plans um, so things that we had more direct control over so our key agreements uh, and I'm not I'm in this presentation, I'm not overviewing every specific agreement we made. I just identified from my perspective what I thought were the key agreements. And as I said, uh, the, the entire documents uh, in the background for the group's review. And as I said, evidence was a huge piece. So under the current system, what we had, what we had said, we had asked teachers to provide two pieces of evidence for each goal and two to three pieces of evidence for each standard. With, un, under the standards, there are 17 indicators in the rubric uh, that performs performances against the standards and under the indicator there's 29 elements now our suggestion was we never came up we never we never ratified an official number that said every teacher had to pass in three pieces of evidence for each goal and for each standard does that make sense it was a suggestion but that suggestion was interpreted very broadly uh, and some people I, I think it was really their intentions were outstanding actually some teachers said you know what I feel like I need to provide evidence for the whole rubric. So I need to provide a piece of evidence for every indicator, every element, every standard. Uh, because I want to show that I, I do my job, I do a great job. Uh, and so we, we would have some people who would turn in 40, 50 pieces of evidence. And we're taking the time to develop 40 or 50 pieces of evidence and turn them in. Because they said, I want to show that I meet all the indicators and all the elements. Uh, so the general, the general expectation was 12 to 8. Like I said, we never ratified an agreed upon number. Uh, it was just a recommendation. And in theory, half of the evidence was supposed to be due at the time you're formative. So if you were on a two-year plan, you're supposed to turn in half your evidence at the end of year one. If you're on a one-year plan, you're supposed to turn in half that evidence in January. And like I said, the evidence piece just really became overwhelming uh, in terms of what, what represented good evidence. So we, there was a lot of discussion about this is good evidence, this, may, this evidence may not be as strong. For each piece of evidence, the teacher was supposed to provide like a paragraph summary of how that evidence ties to the standard. So you as the evaluator, and having done this, you'd look at, so you could look at the piece of evidence and say, yeah, now I, get, I understand how this ties. And the amount of work that was going into the evidence was really a lot a large amount, a huge amount and for a lot of people it was anxiety provoking uh, and it seemed like I don't know if it was really uh, a good match to the concept of um, <clears throat> you know making the system about student you know students learning and it wasn't really necessarily about even the teacher improving their performance it became, uh, so many, many people I think it became like, this is my obligation, I have to do this, I have to provide this piece of evidence to show that I do my work. Uh, and so, you know, the people's ranges of emotions around evidence were pretty wide. Uh, so this is a big piece of discussion of how can we make this uh, uh, less, less unwieldy for people. And 
So I talked a little bit from the teacher side, maybe not great, because I obviously I do well. I do turn on the evidence. So I give you guys evidence for mine, so I do that piece of it. Um, but even from the evaluator's standpoint, if you were an evaluator who got 45 pieces of evidence, you felt like I have to look at all these pieces of evidence because the person took the time to put this all together. So I have to review all 45 pieces of evidence and then take that and write write it into some co uh, cohesive summative evaluation report and statement about them. Uh, so the time that was being put in on both sides didn't seem to match the value of the evidence. Uh, so what we put in, and we actually did say, we called it a new option, because there are some people who may like the system. And we said if they want to do it the old way, they can. If they like, feel really strong about doing evidence, they can do it. Uh, but what we put in the new option for evidence is one piece of evidence for each goal. Remember, each teacher has two goals. Uh, and then they're going to make a summary of performance against the four standards. So the teacher can just write a summary. This is how I feel I meet standard one. This is how I feel I, feel I meet standard two. This is how I meet standard three, et cetera which is a lot different than actually compiling evidence and writing against the evidence. Um, we'll have one piece of evidence for each goal for a two-year formative, uh, and one piece of evidence for a, a summary against the standards for, well, okay, I'll take that back a so. second. So that, that was for your summative. For formatives, and this is a big change as well, <clears throat> is instead of saying half your evidence is due halfway through, so if you're on a two-year plan at the end of year one, you have to turn in half your evidence. All we're saying is at the end of year one, if you're on a two-year plan, you just have to turn in a piece of evidence for each goal. What's your progress on your goals? And the only thing the evaluator is going to write about at the summative is your progress on your goals. Yeah. So we, that created a lot less work on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> one piece of evidence, and then if you're, sorry if I'm getting too rambly, but if, because there's a lot of changes here. If you're on a one-year plan, because a teacher can either be on a two-year plan or a one-year plan, so you're a first-year teacher on a one-year plan, you have, for your formative, you have to turn in one piece of evidence for each goal, and then a quick summary statement on how you meet standards three and four, which is about uh, professional practice and relationships with the community. Uh, so you just kind of say, this, is, this, is how my, this has been my outreach to parents so far in my first year as a teacher. Because the evaluator may not be aware of that, they may not know exactly what you've done yet, you're new in the system, they, so you, you get an opportunity to give them some information about that as they write the formative. This, is a hu this was a huge change. And we haven't ratified this yet. You haven't ratified it yet. Uh, but we decided, I made a decision, uh, that we would do a trial this year. And the union agreed to that prior to their ratification. They just had ratification this past last week. Uh, so we'll do a voluntary trial. And we put the new evidence structures in place for those people who wanted to do that. Uh, and so far, we've gotten a lot of positive on both sides that uh, having this Having the evidence be different is going to be a positive change going forward. I think people are pretty supportive of it. Um, key agreements, I just touched on this a little bit. So the formative report changes. Right now, if you were on a two-year plan, so you're a professional status teacher, you've worked in the district for 10 years. You're on a two-year plan. You've had all proficients, all good observations. You've, done, you've been very successful. Your report at the end of year one was called the formative evaluation report. That report looked just like your summative. It was the exact same report. So in essence, the way the current system existed is every teacher got a summative evaluation at the end of each year. Uh, and we said, this doesn't make sense. So we made the formative less wieldy, and we said, if you're that teacher who's on a two-year plan, who's been in the district for 10 years, very successful, all proficients or exemplaries, that you just have to provide some evidence on your goals, and at the end of year one, that's all the evaluator is going to write about. Here's your goals for your two-year plan. How, what progress have you made on those goals? You provide one piece of evidence. The person just writes about that one piece of evidence for each goal, and that's all you do. Uh, so that really changes that part of the system for everybody. Uh, goal, we did change the goal rating system. Uh, the old, the current rating system was what we adopted from DESI, their recommendation, and we were using the ratings of no progress, some progress, significant progress, met or exceeded, uh, and we just made it more streamlined. 
So you, if you're looking at a goal, you either have made no progress on that goal, you've made some progress on the goal, or you've met it. Uh, it's because we felt sometimes it was hard to determine what does it actually mean, what's the difference between some and significant progress? What does it really mean to exceed the goal versus me and the goal? So we just streamlined the language and went to three a three-point rating scale. Um, observations. We redefined an observation in the system. Uh, so here's our new definition of the observation. I'm not going to read it to you. The key piece in there is that before to be considered an observation report, uh, it had to be a 10-minute observation. It had to be in the classroom for 10 minutes. We extended that time to 15 minutes. We said for it to, so if, if, if I go into a classroom and I'm in a classroom less than 15 minutes, uh, that's not an observation. I have to be in there in the room 15 minutes taking notes. Uh, that doesn't mean, and we're going to get, it's actually the next piece we're going to talk about walkthroughs doesn't mean the teacher and I couldn't have a conversation about what I saw. It just wouldn't be a formal written observation report. Uh, another big piece that I think we agreed to was we actually set some minimums and maximums around uh, observations, and we changed them a little bit. Uh, Desi had given some model lang some When we adopted this whole system, uh, Desi put out a model system. And really, our group kind of adopted the model system. We made some small changes to it. This makes m larger changes to that model system. So we've actually established some minimums and some maximums for observations. So I'll just, I will go through these, and I'll read them and talk about them quickly, more of the ones towards the end. So if you're a first-year teacher, you're required to have a minimum of one announced observation and three unannounced, no max. So the evaluator can go into that teacher's room and do as many observation reports as they want. Uh, if you're a teacher in year two or three, a minimum of one announced observation, two unannounced. This, obviously, the distinction between announced and unannounced is the announced observation is the teacher knows you're coming in, you have a pre-conference, you come in and do the observation, you have a post-conference. Unannounced, that it's not announced. You just show up and you observe some classes. Um, a teacher on a directed growth plan would have a minimum of two unannounced observations, no maximums. This is the big change. So a teacher on a two-year self-directed growth plan with professional status, which is, a, I, I don't have the percentage, that's a, that's a large percentage of our staff. Uh, you figure if we looked at, we talked about uh, percentage on top steps, so two-thirds of our teachers are on the top step. You know, two-thirds of our teachers are on two years self-directed growth plan. It's probably higher than that. It's probably 80% of our teachers are on a two-year self-directed growth plan. Uh, in that, what we've agreed to is a minimum of two observations with a maximum of four over the two-year period. So a teacher who's on a two-year plan, who's, as I said, I give that example again, teacher's been in the system for 10 years, has all proficient and exemplary observations and evaluation results. and all, So all their summative evaluations have been proficient or exemplary, that that person would have two observations over a two-year period, because that's the requirement of the law, but would have no more than four. And the reason why this was put into place is, you know, the, the original, the reason why this whole law was passed and implemented in 2013, I believe, uh, is there were, there were school districts where teachers were not being observed or evaluated. That was not the case in the Carver Public Schools. So at least the time I was an administrator, we were always doing all of our evaluations and observations. You know, anecdotally, I have a friend who's a, a teacher in another district uh, who was a phys physical education teacher, still is there, uh, and before the system was implemented, had worked in that district for 18 years, and they said they had never once been formally evaluated. No administrator had ever come into their gym and done an evaluation on them. Uh, and that was happening in school districts, and there were teachers who were never being evaluated, uh, which is not the teacher's fault. That's the administration's fault. Uh, but it was a concern. So they, the, it became more stringent in terms of the number of observations that had to happen. And the whole base of the system was, let's have more walkthroughs, more discussions with teachers about teaching and learning. Let's get administrators in classrooms and get administrators and teachers and teachers and teachers talking about what's good practice and trying to improve practice. And I think what happened a little bit is I, I when this was when this was passed, I was very excited about this. I, I, I was already, I had been someone who'd already gone, done a lot of walkthroughs. I believed in being in classrooms. I wanted to have conversations. And I was like, this is great. We're going to have all kinds of conversations, all kinds of observations. Not 
looking at it from the standpoint of the person who's a 10, 12, 20 year veteran saying, why are people observing my classroom eight times, 10 times? And they start thinking, A, they start thinking is something going on? It's, you know, do I have specific attention on me? I don't, I don't need that many observations. Because the reality is a formal observation, the matter for some people, not all people, but some people creates a level of anxiety. Um, so by doing eight observations on a professional status teacher who's been in the district for 15 years, over two years, it's really, it's a little bit of overkill. Uh, they, don't, they don't need that level. Uh, and, but we were doing that in some cases. Between our, between our principals, assistant principals, department chairs, there were teachers who were having eight, ten formal observations in their two-year cycle who had um, proficient and exemplary ratings and were really successful. So we all agreed that it, it would be beneficial to establish a maximum. Uh, so for any teacher on a two-year self-directed growth plan, uh, we cannot do more than four formal observations over the two-year period. Um, but I think a great caveat to that is the next bullet, is any rating of an observation of needs improvement or unsatisfactory would remove the maximums. So if you went into a teacher who had been in the district for 15 years and you did an observation, you rated that observation as unsatisfactory, now there's no maximum. So now you can go back and get in and see if and address concerns, uh, but so this is a this is a big change in the system. Um, key agreement we defined walkthrough uh, and the purpose of a walkthrough. And again, I'm not going to read this to you, but I'm going to look the last bullet. Provide feedback if appropriate, but not necessary. In essence, the goal here we wanted to create more conversations about what's happening in classrooms and have more of those conversations not be evaluative. Uh, and the concept of, so yes, there's a maximum of four observations over the two-year cycle, right? But that doesn't mean you can't be in people's classrooms and walking through and talking and talking about teaching and learning. And the goal of the system is to create more conversations about teaching and learning, and maybe more conversations about teaching and learning that aren't 100% evaluative where the person is going to get a written formal observation report as a result of that discussion. Um, and I think I have one more, and then that's it. Um, and the last one was an alternative pathway. Uh, so available for professional status teachers on a two-year self-directed growth plan. Uh, teachers can propose an independent project related to curriculum assessment and instruction. The teacher must identify student learning and professional practice goals tied to the project. The form will be a reflection on the teacher's progress on completion of the project. Uh, teachers would have two observations during the two-year cycle because that's required by the law. Uh, projects must be approved by the superintendent. An example of this, and this is this is an easier example. And I I will say, you know, this this is a little bit of a new concept for us. And most of my examples, maybe because I was a middle high school administrator, I have to focus more on trying to come up with elementary examples of what would be a good project at the elementary level. My so one that we've talked about. Let's say you were gonna say at the middle high school you were gonna introduce and teach a new course. Uh, first time this course is going to be taught, it's going to be an engineering course, because uh, we want to add an engineering course. That, in essence, your whole evaluation system could be based on the concept of designing that course and implementing it. Uh, and so you, it would make sense that your goals would be related to that. It would make sense that you, know, you might have a couple observations in that new course in the second year. Uh, but everything that happens in evaluation would be based on, that's my project. I want to implement this new course. Now, obviously, elementary, you implement a new curriculum. We have next year, we're talking about looking at a different math curriculum. It could be the elementary K2 teachers looking at, I'm going to implement the Bridges uh, curriculum. That's my alternative pathway. Uh, so it just gives them different options on how to approach the evaluation system and pr present projects to the administration to be approved uh, for the evaluations. Um, I know this is this is something we spent days and days on. I, I, I don't know if I've done it justice uh, in this whatever time I just spent on it, 20 minute presentation, 15 minute presentation. Um, I wanted to try to get you some of the key ideas. So the summary, the big changes are around evidence, numbers of observations for professional status teachers, uh, form of evaluations. Uh, and the those pieces, are gonna, I believe, are going to remove stress points for everybody. Uh, and, we, and, and I think it's going to uh, make a system that's going to hopefully lead to more dialogue, more discussions. Um, and a, a piece of it I didn't put in here is what we actually agreed to is that 
prior to doing a formative or summative evaluation, the teacher is going to do like that summary of their performance against the standards, that the evaluator will meet with them and just have a discussion about their performance against the standards. Uh, that's not required in the old system, so it didn't necessarily have to be a meeting. You had all these observations, all these things happening, but it wasn't necessarily a, a meeting with a discussion about education. Now we're actually creating a system where we're saying that meeting may be a five minute meeting, it may be a longer discussion about what that person is doing in their classroom, uh, which gets us back to that concept of uh, improving teaching and learning and making it student focused and student centered. Um, so we're, I'm, I'm looking for approval for this document tonight. The union has, I said, as Tammy said, they ratified last Wednesday, uh, and then this would put the new uh, changes into effect for the next school year. I'll make a motion to approve the changes for the teacher evaluation system. Second. Comments? Discussion. What is your what is your platform for this evaluation? So we right now we we are just using Drive. Uh, so we used to use uh, Baseline Edge. Uh, we found Baseline Edge to be <laughs> not very effective and not a very effective system. Uh, people just everyone struggled with it. <laughs> Administrators, evaluators, teachers. Um, <clears throat> so then we looked at some other options. We evaluated some other storage systems uh, and what. One of, the, one of the agreements, the original agreement, is there, there is an evaluation committee that meets ongoing a couple times a year. And through that committee, uh, we had said, uh, we agreed to go to have it done in the Drive platform. So everything is stored in Google Drive right now. Basically, a teacher has a team drive with their evaluator. Um, part of this agreement says that when the evaluation committee will meet by October of 2020, Let's give, we said we're saying we're going to give it a year to run it, the new system. And then we're going to come back together at the beginning of the next school year and say, how did last year go? What went well? What didn't go well? Do we need to make any changes or revisions to what we've done? This was a pretty solid ratification. Everybody happy with that? Yeah. It's good, right? As a member of the, of the negotiations committee, and we, you know, we heard the, the concerns, it's I'm, I'm glad you guys came up this I, I've been through several evaluation systems and some of them are just looking for 90 pieces of evidence and it's just ridiculous and this just seems to be what the teachers were looking for and honestly what's gonna what's gonna benefit everybody in a, in a logical way so okay. I think it's great great work for everyone, from everybody yeah, I agree. Um, and as an evaluator who looked through 45 pieces of evidence this afternoon to prepare for summatives, I really appreciate this. Um, my question is, during the formatives, um, we, you have the summaries. If the summaries in the evaluator's opinion don't really match up to the unannounced that have been seen, so if there's a disconnect between what the evalu evaluator sees in the unannounced and what's written in the summary, can they request evidence? Um, yeah, just to you, kind of validate certainly. what's in the summary. Certainly. Okay. And the other, the other thing I was going to ask about too was, and, I, and we want it to be through a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece I didn't touch on here is, if the evaluator is going to change your rating at your formative, because under the le legally under the system they can. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a two-year plan and you're at the end of year one and, and you're going to get it, and against one of the standards, you're going to go from proficient to exemplary. They have to write about that. And they have to say why they made that change. Or if they were going to go from exemplary to proficient or exemplary to needs improvement, they'd have to write about that change. And our thought process would be before they wrote about that change, they'd have a discussion with the teacher about it. The teacher would know and give the teacher the opportunity of, well, what additional evidence can you provide me? Uh, you know, so if, if you're going to go from proficient to needs improvement, give the person the opportunity to say, or provide evidence or have a discussion or provide additional summaries of, of why they why that shouldn't happen, why they feel like they've met the standard. Uh, so that I didn't you know, I didn't mention that in here specifically, but that is part of the system. So that's part of the plan is that discussion first. Yes. I think that's a respectful outreach to the teachers where, you know, a lot of people often get comments when there's no conversation that ever happened and they're like, Well what does that mean? Where that where'd that come from? Mm. And I think that clarity and of our, conversation first. And our goal is to have those conversations before those formatives and summers are written, yeah. which might be a little bit more of a daunting piece for the administrators and the teacher because, you know, uh, you know if you have a caseload of, uh, you know, one, my worst, I'll give you my worst case example. One year I did have 22 formatives or summatives to write uh, as the principal. You know, is that, now I just created 22 meetings uh, prior to writing those documents. Uh, but 
uh, I think that's going to be valuable, especially if it's a good, if it's a well done summary, and you know, the, the evaluated administrator feel like it's a good reflection of what's happening in the classroom. We definitely had this conversation. If that's something you know, they can use pieces of that summary in terms of writing the document, that's the purpose of it. And one last clarify: Is this just for teachers, not for paras or admin? But all the is this? This is, this is just for teachers right now. Okay. Uh, now, as part of the para negotiations this year, I agreed, and I, I'll look at EAPC members. I agreed that we would do a similar thing for them. Uh, so we, I haven't started that yet. My goal is when we come back next year in September to form a similar committee uh, with a couple para professionals, a couple members of the administration, and re, uh, redo their tool. The paras tool right now is actually a checklist which is yeah. pretty outdated uh, so uh, that's going to be totally uh, okay. redone uh, in terms of the administrators um, the piece I'd like to meant there is the same on the concept of the formative so if, a, if an administrator is on a two-year self-directed growth plan and they've had a, so they've had a radio proficient or exemplary and they have more than three years mm -hmm. in the system uh, that their evaluation in their formative year would become goals only uh, so I am going to implement that with uh, the administrators as well and in September I'm going to I'll give the, a little foreshadowing to the committee in the September if the committee wishes uh, since I will since I've begun my fourth year uh, you could do the same with me in terms of you could allow me just to do goals only at the end of year one, which would be next year, and then the next year go back to the full evaluation system. But that would be your choice. <laughs> uh, but I'll full shout that when I bring my goals in September, okay. uh, I'll let you know that that year you can rate me and just give me progress on my goals only if you choose to. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Andrew, you have anything? No, I'm good. Um, I have one question about this uh, in this uh, document. Where is, is there any area that takes the weight of any parental input on a teacher? If someone has... Teachers are supposed to, uh, well, it's agreed that teachers will, well, after I could put up the, I should put the language exactly so I say it right, is that it's, it's a recommendation or suggestion that teachers will get student input and do student surveys. That was part of the original law. Mm -hmm. The original law doesn't, doesn't require parental surveys. So was, teachers would survey their students. Mm -hmm. uh, administrators would survey their staff. No, I'm talking about a parent that might have repeated complaints about a staff member. Does that get weighed into anywhere? That's not part of the, that's not that's not part of the evaluation job, system yeah, tool, right. Well, why wouldn't it be part of their job evaluation? It's not, so, it's not part of their job, so, not part of their evaluation. Okay. So here, here's my broad answer to that question. Right. My broad answer is multiple sources of evidence. Mm -hmm. And a administrator can uh, use multiple sources of evidence uh, in their evaluate, in the summative evaluation. Um, so if there, were, if there were consistent parental complaints about an issue, that and that issue was brought to the teacher's attention, and and the and the administrator determined that the concerns were real, uh, and valid, and asked and said to the teacher, I I believe these concerns are real and valid, and you need to make this adjustment. And the teacher didn't make that adjustment. That could certainly be in the sum of the evaluation. So, there, but it wouldn't be a direct. So there'd be room for consideration yeah, of all, repeated. Right. It, that's all. Issues. That's a that's a source of evidence. Okay. That was my only question. Um, do we have a vote to uh, we have a vote to approve? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those with no one opposed, unanimous. Aye. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a big thing done, man. That was, was, a, a, that was, yeah, that was a lot of work done that. So I want to thank again the EAPC and all the members of the committee. <clears throat> all right, school committee meetings. Uh, so go look at next year's meetings. We have two meeting calendars in here. Basically, one is to have the meetings on the second Mondays. There was some discussion about maybe moving the meetings to the second Thursdays. Uh, ultimately, when the school committee meets is the choice of the committee and the will of the committee. Um, so, you know, we've historically always met on the second Monday. Sometimes the second Monday is problematic because the second Monday is uh, correlates with the holiday. Uh, so like ne in next year's schedule, I believe both Columbus Day and Veterans Day are the second Mondays. So those months we'd have to meet either the third Monday or the first Monday. So it creates this little imbalance. 
Uh, some people just think Thursday nights are better than Monday nights in terms of because our meetings tend to go a little long. Uh, if you're going to be here till 9.30, would you rather be here at 9.30 on a Monday night or a Thursday night? Uh, ultimately, uh, I defer to the will of the committee on this. Uh, does, doesn't matter to me. And I just picked Thursday nights because the suggestion was do we, have, do we consider another night rather than Monday? So someone else could say, I really like Wednesday nights. Let's look at that. Personally, I have to say Thursday nights would work out much better for me. But uh, let's, see, let's see what the will of the committee is. Would you like to change it for to I a brought it up. Day, I saw the, the change was my kind of my idea. So I'm, I'm all for moving it to Thursdays. Mm -hmm. so. I don't know. I mean, I, I, seven years of Mondays I've been coming. So I don't know. It, it just appears weird to me to make that switch. Um, I, I mean, if the committee's for it, I, I'd go with it. I tend to would rather do it on Mondays myself only because that's a day that is – I guess I'm common with and it's a day that sort of works out Thursdays can be hectic busy days so I mean it works either either one works for me but whatever you whatever the will of the committee is S Stephanie uh, said that she doesn't care yeah didn't care she goes to the will of the committee do you want me to share that I don't care yeah <laughs> so I've got two we had two Thursdays and two I don't, uh, Monday and two I don't care we need a motion to officially move it since it's on well, I guess you know I'd rather have a c consensus idea where we're going because there's two different votes it could be I guess so you want to uh, maybe I can call make for a, someone can make a motion to move to have the meetings be the Thursday oh, schedule no, we do that we have a motion yeah, I'll meeting. make a motion to move this cook many meetings to the second Thursday of every month we have a second yeah. we have a second I'd second that okay all those in favor aye 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 so yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> um, so on the Thursday calendar. Oh, oh I should have. Oh, I, sorry. I should have uh, asked if there was any more further discussion right. on that. Uh, sorry. Uh, we voted. Yeah. Right. On the Thursday calendar, um, I'd like to leave that one open, uh, whether we do the 8th or the 15th. Um, just because, and then actually this was going to be true whether it was Monday or Thursday. I just don't, I have, I'll be, I have not set my personal vacation schedule. I'm going away one of those two weeks, either the second or the third week, probably the second week. Uh, so I, I guess I'd, if, if you're okay leaving that open for a couple of weeks, I'll tell you in June when, if we're going to do the third, the August 15th. So that, my sense would be, it'd be August, August 15th, the third week. Right. Third I'm on vacation the 15th. If that you're happens. on vacation the 15th? All right. Anybody else on vacation that week in August? Uh, um. Well, I guess why don't we say this for our June meeting? Why don't we look at our vacation schedules and we'll pick an August date? Okay. But September four, we'll go. September we'll do Thursdays. Everybody's okay with that? Yeah. yeah. All right. So okay. so June we'll look at. We'll we'll pick the August meeting date in June, um, based on everybody's vacation schedules. Okay. Sounds good. All right. All right next. Uh, can I just put all the field trips together? Yep. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the field trips uh, for Europe 2021. Grade 7 New York City, uh, December 6, 2019 trip, and the French students grades 9 through 12 to Quebec, Canada, February of 2020. Okay, we have a motion. Need a second? A second. Can I, and then mind if I just make one uh, notification on this, uh, <clears throat> is the other trip, the Europe trip and the grade 7 trip are uh, trips that, we, that usually occur. Um, actually, is that the grade 8? Is that a mistake? It's the grade 8 trip. So the, let's, let's correct the mistake. New York City? Yeah, it's the grade eight trip to New York City, December 6, 2019, not grade seven. Yeah, it's a grade eight. Okay. The Europe trip's a traditional trip that we, you know, we, if we get enough students, we try to do the, the Europe trip every year. Uh, the French trip to Canada, we did that for, I think, three years, and we haven't done it in three or four. So this is, this is a trip we've done before. Uh, it's a trip that the people running have been on. I have experience in doing it, but it's a new trip for us a little bit because it's been a couple of years since we've done it. I just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to make a couple of years. So I just wanted to make, point that out. Yeah. Any further debates, questions? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. I say uh, budget transfer transfers. Yeah, before we get into FY19, do we want to talk about FY20 and how we'll have an update, or do you want to? Well, let's leave that for now. We'll just come back to it in, well, in June. I guess you can say in June we'll have an update for FY20. We will, but do we want to talk about what we'd like to do for anticipated posting? No, we're going to hold off on that a little okay. bit. All right. So FY19 budget transfers. Um, you have three tabs on there. You have the 5-2 overall. Okay. You have the entire journal entry. And then you have the highlights. The highlights is Meredith. That's the one you can go to. 
so it's not showing me numbers on your side. I know you guys like to hear the numbers, so give me a second. <laughs> That's you, James. <laughs> it's a small list, though. Ooh. Yeah. There's no battery. Yeah. What did you open? You can just read the Diet. 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 Huh? Okay, I'm sure. dying. I'll bring my charger with me next time. Okay, so the first couple are, um, the first one is just a uh, district-wide SPED contract that services that falls in line with all of our SPED um, actual budget line items this year, again, short as of uh, to date. Um, next two are the teacher long-term subs. Um, we're doing not great in the long term. We have, I think, three or four, maybe possibly five um, maternity leaves and long-term absences that we're covering for the rest of the year, so we're journal entering a little bit of money into that. But we also saved on um, other short-term subs this year. Not a crazy year for uh, sickness, so we did pretty well on that. Um, classroom aides at CES and the middle high school. Um, we're journal entering more money into there. Um, this is based off the contractual increases, but these two accounts are gonna go more into the red um, as we go along. But we do have money in 240 um, because we had such a changeover in terms of paraprofessionals that um, the original ones who were allocated to be paid off the grant left we kept the new budget as people came in we charged them to the operational budget and now it's just moving the money over from the operational to the grant um let's see here elementary english um, textbooks we're taking away sixteen thousand. we are adding it to the elementary math textbooks based on curriculum needs um, that the uh, elementary school felt that the math curriculum they like to purchase a program and that's what we're going to do move forward with that um, this is widespread additional equipment again just want to highlight that's another short area same as the sped eval testing sped contracted services again i just want to highlight this because this is going to be a continued area of up and down um, roller coaster ride that is the out of district contracts that we have for um, transportation we're kicking in um, another two thousand dollars to that that's going to bring that grand total just under 200 grand for fy19 um, budget um, homeless transportation Again, that's an up and down one. If a student moves out, we may be, um, eligible, we may be eligible to pay their expenses for the whole year. Um, sometimes they find residency right away. It all depends and fluctuates. That is a line item that we are looking to move um, $2,000 out of, and we're gonna spend roughly in the $25,000 range if everything stays current for the rest of the year. Elementary at the middle high school, um, we have two bills left. Um, we're in a pretty good spot right there, so we took off 6000 I would have taken more off, but I'll hit that later on in the bottom one. Health insurance, we had a couple people drop from individual, to, uh, excuse me, from family to individual, and a couple people dropped health insurance altogether. And if you guys remember, we used February 1st enrollment numbers for our next year's operational. Um, so again, that can fluctuate either way. We had a $50,000 savings this year in that. Plymouth um, Carver Retiree Health Insurance, um, how that works is Plymouth actually holds all of those um, enrollees on a plan and they bill us back every April for that. Um, it's an aging population, so that number just keeps declining um, as people pass away. Um, so we actually were projected to spend 72,000 based on last year's bill. That actually came in at 57 for this year. Um, so again, that actually helps next year's budget because I think I carried over right around 70,000 for the actual budget. So we know that number at the worst case scenario will come in at 57,000 next year. Again, and we think that'll continue to decrease as we go on. Um, retiree health insurance, we had a mid-year adjustment. Um, Harvard Pilgrim Medicare plan was dropped and everyone went on to the uh, Blue Care, uh, excuse me, Blue Cross Blue Shield network plan um, for retirees. That saved right around 45,000. That's money will kick in um, to the line I'm right below that. So the secondary SPED tuition um, line, we were $94,000 short alone on that line. So the savings pretty much between both retiree health insurance and active health insurance covered that line item expense. Um, I won't have you guys open it, but on the 5-2 when you look at the overall budget, the other um, line item is the SPED secondary tuitions for collaboratives. That's all at the middle high school level um, for out-of-district placements. That number alone is $170,000 short. Um, so that's one thing I want to you guys remember as we go through the next few down below. Um, that 170 number is an amount we're chasing. I'd love to cover all of our 
um, any savings we have individual items at the end of the year we transfer that in to drop that shortfall a little bit but with the sped reserve account that the town did set up that's the balance how we'll offset that at the end of the year um, i don't want to put a hard number to say we're going to be in the 100 to 120 range but that'd be my guess if i had to project it out right now um, which would leave right around 60 to 80 thousand in that sped reserve account with the additional the 105 that um, came in as the uh, town meeting as well um, so if you look just the natural gas um, we have one bill left actually excuse me we have two bills left for that um, usually the last bill very minimal cost based on um, gets a little bit warmer in the buildings we don't have to turn on the heat um, so those two numbers I'm hoping to capitalize anywhere between 10 to 15 thousand to offset that sped cost um, and also we have um, don't worry about the telecommunication services the electric um, electric as well we're projected to have some savings in there that again we can kick into offset the uh, the special ed overage we have again the goal of all of this the bottom one is to put the balances that we have in those accounts to offset what our shortfall is for the sped reserve account we have to take less out of that okay Brad, when you said about the electricity savings it was scrolled down real fast was that at the middle high school or is that at the elementary school? scroll down Meredith Are you on the third tab? Go to highlights. Oh, highlights. <laughs> Last one. Yep, and go down. Last two. It's all three buildings right now. We're projected to save, including central office. We're projecting, obviously I don't have all the bills in yet, but I'm projecting to have uh, anywhere from, I'd say, 15 to 20 grand in each building. So we were really concerned about those line yeah, items yeah. early in the year because yep. the bills were coming in crazy, yep. and we were ups we were like we were projecting the other way. Right. And but the end result is after the systems every everything that they told us that I thought was crazy happened. Because just it's, our usage was so high the first four yeah. months, it really didn't need one cycle of running through for the first three four months, it's and it's back. Higher. So we we went we went from thinking we were going to have thousands of dollars being short yeah. to being on the good side. Yeah piece of this though don't forget which is important because I don't want us to think that we overestimated next year's budget is forty thousand dollars of elementary electrical costs were journal entry back into the actual project costs because it was a right it was an expense before we actually took over the yeah. building that we used that one-time money for um, so we might be actually right on the number exactly <laughs> exactly all right any other discussion on uh, budget transfers I'll make a motion to approve the uh, budget transfers for FY19. Second. Seconded. We have a motion and second. Uh, all those approved? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Okay. I lost my computer here, so. So it's uh, reports for the school committee. Oh, reports for the school That's committee. That's where we are. Nice if any. Um, on this member sheet, my email address is, is missing a letter. So between the J and the G, there should be a W. Just for. If you can scribble it down, if there's any changes, that'd be great. James? Uh, lots of events coming up, but uh, one of the big ones is all you lucky seniors who are going to be graduating before we meet again. So, congratulations to all of you and all okay. that hard work getting through. Definitely. All right. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, to all the teachers, you know, finish strong. Have a have a you know great next few weeks uh, before the school year ends, um, and hopefully uh, by June 10th we'll uh, have nice weather. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, um, I'd like to just finish tonight's meeting uh, with a couple announcements and then a comment. Um, I hope everyone can go to uh, the Carver Sportsman's Club Scholarship Breakfast this Saturday, May 18th from 7.30 to 11. It's $8 at the door, and I guess uh, I hear it's a great time, uh, turnout every time. Um, I think it's all you can eat, too. It is. I, I've gone in the past. It's a it's, good event. I'm going to try and make it, but I s seem to work on Saturdays, but I'm going to try and make that one. Also, uh, I hope we can get a good representation from the school committee this year at, uh, at the commencement on June 1st. Uh, good representation uh, of the committee to be there for the students graduating. Um, also, I would just like to thank my fellow committee members for having faith in me and for nominating and voting for me to be uh, the chair of your committee. I, uh, I really appreciate it and I'm very humbled by the, uh, by, um, 
the action to do so, for a better, for lack of a better word. All right. Thank you very much, and I uh, hope I, I, and I also want to thank uh, James O'Brien, uh, former chairman, for the years he put in, uh, you know, in this role. And I will try to, I will endeavor to be as fair as he, and as, you know, level-headed uh, on every concern. And I, uh, huh? Open-minded, maybe. Open, no, level -headed. no, you're level-headed. You're open-minded too, but. You've uh, led this committee through some tough times, and I appreciate it, and I know the rest of us do as well. So thank you. And uh, good night, and I'd like to uh, adjourn this meeting. What time is it now? It's uh, 9.50. I'll move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Sorry about that. I have a second? No second. All right. It's 9.57. All those approved? Aye. 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 All right. So, so be it. Aye. Thank you.